Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of the MinMax Show, a place about games, friends, and getting better. My name is Ben Hanson. Thank you for being here. I'm joined by Cal Hilliard. Hanson, I got a new camera, and it's going to work great. <laughs> you animal! <laughs> also joined by Jacob Geller, wherever he is. Hello. Hello. I have the same camera. <laughs> and then also Kelsey Lewin. Hello. Welcome. I've got, like, weird lighting today because uh, one of my light bulbs went out, so I'm opening the window a little bit. It my actually, camera's not great is what I'm getting at. No, I think it looks cool. It has like a, a okay, cool, cool color to it. Like it looks very stylized and intentional. So just lean into it and it looks like there's yeah, more games there, behind you too. Like I would count five, maybe six. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a handful. Yeah. A small handful. <laughs> uh, what's going on with you, Kelsey? You keep uh, tweeting pictures from some convention or something? Yeah, Emerald City Comic Con starts tomorrow, but setup was yesterday, which is kind of a weird situation. Usually we're setting up the booth. Um, so my, my store's that I co-own, we yeah. take like a big booth to these conventions and we just, we sell a bunch of stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, normally set up as the day before, but for this one, for whatever reason, we had to build the booth yesterday. Then I have a day quote unquote off today, which is really just like sit here and stress out until tomorrow. Uh, and then yeah, Thursday through Sunday is the actual show. How do you feel about building up the Pink Gorilla booth at all these conventions over and over again? Is it just, I mean, are, are you taking a hammer over and over again? Do you feel like you have it down to a system and a science or what's that like? Oh yeah. I love it. Like I think we're so good at it now that it's actually kind of fun because I feel like people watch us and go like, wow, that looks impressive. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I've been doing this for 10 years. I know what I'm doing. You get to be <laughs> like one a of the few things in life where I feel like I just, I know what I'm doing and I'm, you know, it's a very niche skill to build a convention booth, but like that, that's a skill I have and I will, I, I get to take that with me. Yeah, no, that's cool. I mean, you get to be like a roadie or something, just like going through the beats, <laughs> just like building this stuff over and over and over again. It's the coolest gig. Um, why do they call it Emerald City Comic Con? Seattle is the Emerald City. Really? Does everyone yeah, know like our, that? Like, like Chicago is the Windy City. We're the Emerald City. I'm, do you have a contact at the Seattle City Council or something? Because they're doing a bad job with PR. Because I spent a lot of time in Seattle and I did not have that in my You've mind. You've never heard that? I mean, I probably have, but it didn't sink in. I mean, Kyle Jacob, my nuts. Have you heard of this? Uh, one short day in the Emerald City. Wait, what is that? Is that a thing? That's from, that's from Wicked. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like I'm, fam I'm familiar with the Wizard of Oz Emerald City. I didn't know it was about Seattle. But no, hey, it actually is. New every day. Yeah, the mayor is Oz in Seattle. It's a very convoluted thing they don't talk about too much. Ben. I thought I thought it was the infamous Second Sun City. I thought that was the official yeah. state name. That's right. The yeah. infamous Second Sun City Comic Con was the original <laughs> name for that whole experience. <laughs> Uh, well, Does hey, Minneapolis have a, have a city nickname? Uh, well, Diablo Cody in Young Adult, the film, she called it the Minneapolis. Um, and that was the first time I, I ever that. heard that was sitting in a theater and mm -hmm. I was like looking around other people in Minneapolis like, what? Minneapolis? Are we going to go with this? I've never heard this before. Um, but we have Twin Cities, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. You get to be one half of of a thing. Yeah, we're a team. I think it works out okay. Just for the record, uh, Durham is Bull City, which is very fun. Well, yeah, I've, I've heard that one. I've heard that. Bull City. Oh. Yeah. Like bull like or bull? Like, like bull like girl. A bull. Oh, mm -hmm. that sounds good. That's fun. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, hey, on this week's episode of the podcast, we are going to be talking about Roller Drome, uh, a game that we talked about a little bit uh, a couple weeks ago, but we're going to unpack in a bigger way now that it's actually out. We're going to be talking about Midnight Fight Express, which is hot off the presses. Kyle, do you want to talk about Jetpack Joyride 2? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. I've, I've been playing it. Let's do it. Um, and then finally... We're doing it. We're having a discussion, everybody, about Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Every week, there are people in the comments like, why aren't you talking about the best game of the year? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? This is going to satiate all of you, I promise, and you're going to have no complaints or thoughts. Uh, and then back half of the show, we have a bunch of great community questions. But um, let's kick this show off in a different kind of way. And people watching us live at the Backstage Pass here, I feel like we need your help a little bit here. Um, but Kyle uh, and I recently were on Emily Reese's podcast, friend of the show, the music expert herself. Um, and I think that episode's coming out next week, I think. But Kyle mentioned something and it stuck in my craw. What is a craw? <laughs> Your head? Your brain? Is it? Okay, but anyways, uh, Kyle said something where he's like, you know, I actually installed Red Dead Redemption 2 recently because I just wanted to go play something that was really expensive. 
And it really stuck with me of like, I get that feeling. You just every once in a while need to like soak in something that's just such a ridiculous production from the game industry. It just feels like it's in an arena all its own. And so we're thinking about like, well, how do you define what that is? And the best we could come up with is like an epic game. Yes. <laughs> but not the developer. No, nowhere <laughs> the near definition. the developer. That's right. The actual <laughs> definition. This is not an epic micro mega game or whatever the hell their full yeah. name was. In fact, I don't think Fortnite fits this description, honestly. Uh, Character wise? It is like in some ways the most epic game if you really want to go for just like crazy I, production. And, and like a multiverse bit. kind of you know that I that think it has buzzword. become that thanks to its popularity, but my thought was more just like just the games that cost like probably billions of dollars before anyone even touches them and plays them. Like the right. sort of the blank check idea, right? Of like just like well, and not they in have, licensing I'm, costs. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. like they Fortnite have a lot probably costs in, a bazillion. Well, I mean, honestly, that also, is something. I guess one of the things that I was thinking about was like games that are, and this is more, you know, on on all of our favorite podcasts, Blank Check, they, they talk about, you know, it means like a director having free reign, essentially. And so it's like right. Fortnite is an unbelievably expensive game, but it also feels like almost every decision was made with marketing in mind. Uh, which I feel like is maybe different than something like Red Dead 2, which often feels almost anti-consumer in like how <laughs> weird and expensive it is. Uh, and so yeah. we can we can talk this out, but I didn't just choose like kind of games that cost a million dollars and were like, or, you know, a billion dollars and were guaranteed to sell a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. I kind of tried to go with ones that were more like almost uh, strange that they had so much money poured into them. No questions were asked. Yeah, I mean, the Fortnite thing is interesting because it, it kind of came, at least for my read of it, it feels like it came from a place of like a slight desperation. Not that Epic was ready to implode, but they were looking for like, okay, we're after Gears of War. What is our next big thing? What can we swing to? Gears of War Judgments wrapping up for that co-development with People Can Fly. And then it's like, okay, Minecraft's huge. Let's make this fort building game. And I guess free to play might be a thing and we could learn some lessons. Let's go for it. Um, and then it evolved into such a mess. But I still don't know. Does anybody out there know who's paying who for these characters in Fortnite at this point? Like, couldn't you make an argument that it's like almost breaking even in terms of who's doing who a favor? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm totally not confident that Epic is paying like I, I don't know and i don't know like you know it's like does epic just pay like you know here's here's 30 million dollars for goku but then when people <laughs> buy goku skin epic gets that money or is it like here's goku for free but then when people buy goku that money goes to whoever owns goku like i don't know yeah. i don't know how that works yeah i i wouldn't be surprised if there's not a lot of money changing hands at that early stage you know what i mean because it's like the marketing sort of value of goku being in fortnite and you know and the new mo dragon ball movies coming out on friday yeah like there might just be like favors being exchanged here i we are talking out of our butt like we have no idea I don't, it's I not no clear clue. but i think fortnite's a weird one but red dead redemption 2 i think stands a part of my mind and especially with like you know the news that we talked about on the podcast a couple weeks ago when kelsey was on it talking about gta 5 and that news I mean, that's going to be an epic, gigantic thing. But I was just wondering, like, is it going to be the case if everyone looks back on Red Dead Redemption 2 as like this weird high point for truly absurd rock star productions? I mean, having Dan Hauser still at the studio then, a lot of the old guards still at the studio, they're kind of at the end of their road. Is it going to be 20 years from now, we'll look back and be like, God, that was... That was a very unique rock star that it ballooned to that point before it started shifting and evolving in a lot of healthy ways. Doesn't every I, rock star game kind of do that, though? Yeah. This is what I was going to bring up, because <laughs> one one on my list that I'll just get out early, because I don't think it should be on the final list, but it's just too weird, is Max Payne 3. Uh, oh, because that's also it's also a rock star game. It also cost an unbelievable amount and like. It did not do well. You know, like, I think one of the things with, like, if you put $500 million into GTA 6, you're going to get that money back. Like, 
I don't think they got the money back that they put into Max Payne 3. Or if they hmm. did, they were much closer to, like, breaking even. And that game is just so weird for costing that much which makes it kind of stand out more for me yeah that feels like a case of like well it's a big brand you know we're going to develop it internally here for the first time at rockstar we gotta do it right but uh, let's not go nuts with it and then i feel like it's probably one of those situations of like well rockstar we really gotta go all in and so then it just starts to balloon and balloon and balloon like i remember one time at naughty dog talking to i think neil and, and bruce straley over there um, and they're talking about like, oh, it'd be fun to work on like a small project here at Naughty Dog. But I think just inevitably it would snowball and then turn into a gigantic AAA makeup project. Like there's just some studios that can't help themselves when that's the impulses of and kind of the, the routine that all these developers are in. It feels like Max Payne 3 was kind of it should have been a cheaper production. But what are you going to do? We're yes, rock stars. Exactly. You know? That's an interesting one. I think I think that's an interesting contender. It, so here's a rough format is maybe we should try and build out a list and then whittle it down to like five. The five faces on Mount Rushmore, as we all know and love, for truly. And it can't all be rock star. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I actually thought it was. I mean, it is. You're totally right. It's a slippery slope. I'm like, okay, well, yeah. San Andreas for its time was certainly ridiculously ambitious, even though now in retrospect, they made it in like two years or something bananas like that, you know? Um, well, can I make a, an argument about this? I don't know, this entire concept real quick. Because please. The... I feel like we almost have to be, unless we change the definition slightly, we almost have to be dealing entirely in modern games. Like the oldest we can really point to is like a Shenmue. Um, unless oh. we, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. in terms I think of that's a great, I think that's a great inclusion. Epic. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, I was going to argue for Shenmue for sure. Yeah. But like, but I would also argue, I mean, we can, I don't know if we want to start here, but like, I could argue that the original Super Mario Brothers is, an epic that threw everything at the wall and was kind of a, a blank check, kind of let them do whatever they want, last hurrah. But obviously now, next to like a GTA, it's just a game, you know? Like it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't look... I, I mean, obviously it's a classic and it's amazing. Wait, are you talking about the, ri- like, the 85, like the NES one? Yeah. Okay, yeah, see, that still feels almost experimental without going crazy to me but like uh, yeah I no I, I think I it's interesting like you know i think weird ambiguous definition of this well, thing do you, you know but do you know the story of like the development of that one probably not as well I mean, as i should please yeah Regale us please <laughs> everybody uh light a campfire at Educate home us. um get comfortable <laughs> kelsey will tell us the story of mario brothers i mean i'm not gonna get crazy into the weeds but the the context is like the famicom had been out for a couple of years at this point they hadn't really discovered yet that you could like you know, add more chips to an NES cart and do do some interesting things to like make the cartridges themselves more powerful. They were just drawing, you know, purely on the Famicom's power. Um, and they had just made this Famicom disk system thing, which was going to be way cheaper and way easier. And it would give them a little bit more, you know, space to do with, uh, to like, you know, more space to make things. And so they were like, I think we're kind of done with this cartridge thing. Let's make one last hurrah like the most perfect nes game we can possibly make here on the like, fit onto one cartridge and so you know it, it having like a, an underground and a sky excuse me a sky and um you know there was originally supposed to be like a, a plane fighting section and all of that stuff what? i mean it was really meant to be the like end all be all of the famicom Looking back now, obviously, compared to a rockstar game it's like yes that was very ambitious for 1985 that's cute We've we've progressed a lot since then, but like for 1985, that was as epic as a console game could possibly be. And I think we're going to end up like not talking about a lot of PC games that really deserve yeah, you're right. <laughs> their place here. There's always this part PC honest, crowd. But... No, you're totally right. And I think I think you're right that it's tough not to just look at more recent stuff when you think of the truly ambitious epic games. But like, I guess you just have to look at like the scale of the budgets relative to their time and day. And I'd imagine even Super Mario Brothers was like, what? You're spending well, $100,000? Because of... It's a factor. Budget, I, I think that's a factor too, but like... I don't know. Maybe I'm just maybe I'm just getting way too no, I like like, it. into I, the I like, weeds with no, this. <laughs> no, put Mario Brothers on the list. I think that's a really interesting one. And this is why you're here, Kelsey, because nobody else would have thought of the original Super Mario Brothers as an epic game. But relative and at the time, I, I think that's a case you can make. Yeah. I mean, my if we wanted to start throwing them out, my Please. furthest, my oldest one that I had on my personal list was Ocarina of Time. Just because like 
just the sort of this, the amount of time it took and just sort of the ambitiousness of it and how it was, it was originally supposed to almost have a Mario 64 kind of setting, right? Where you were in a castle and then they were able to sort of like put it out into like, you know, an early take on a 3D open world. And just like, even the way they approached like music and sound in it and those kind of things in like the jump from, you know, Link to the Past or, you know, Link's Awakening, whichever, I don't know which one came first. I guess, I guess Link's Awakening was between those yeah. two, right? Yeah. Link's Awakening was right before Ocarina of Time. And, uh, and also just like, just the vastness of that game and what it ultimately became and how long they worked on it. That to me felt like it was like Miyamoto sort of like, you know, stretching his wings and being like, how far can I take this thing? It feels like, especially in that N64 era, even after Mario 64 being what it was, it was like, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to take the sort of base we established with that and apply it to Zelda and just blow it up in such a huge way. See, I mean, there's like, we're having like multiple timelines and stuff like that. You know, there's like different yeah. eras you can explore in the game. It feels, it feels like, it, it feels like a very expensive game for the time. In my mind, and maybe <laughs> this is where we just nitpick the hell out of each other's picks. Um, but it's like, I feel like Mario 64 is, is the epiphany. And I'm not saying that Ocarina of Time isn't an amazing game. Obviously it is. But I feel like it was a little bit of like, wow, okay. I can't wait to see what the equivalent for the Zelda series looks like on the 64. Wow, it's this amazing game. It's this open experience. In terms of like the mind-blowing production, I feel like Mario 64 is the one that really rips off that band-aid of like what gaming could be this generation, you know? I guess I just look at it as like like you said I don't think you're wrong like as Mario being like the proof of concept and then Zelda was the one that got the sort of huge budget and time to be yeah. like okay see that's what we can do now we're gonna blow it up kind of like my other my rock star pick was gonna be San Andreas yeah because like GTA 3 was the hit Vice City was the very profitable quick turnaround and then San Andreas was the like even though it was only like a two year development time it was like we're gonna make three cities we're gonna this is gonna be ridiculous we're gonna get Samuel L. Jackson in this one <laughs> we're gonna throw tons of money at this thing yeah I am um, god I think I've told this story on the podcast before but back at Game Informer um, I found there's a box Kelsey you made me remember this there's a box that had a bunch of old uh, interviews from like old cover stories at Game Informer and stuff like that and I started to digitize them forget if you have the box now kelsey at the video game history foundation um i we have them all digitized okay. i'm pretty sure okay awesome. um i'm not a hundred percent sure about that but I'm, I'm pretty sure we did end up getting through that whole okay i hope box. so because it was so fun to like digitize this old stuff just like a little bit i might have even just been listening and not even starting to digitize it in a big way but it was the cover story for san andreas and it was matt helgson host of crossfade here at min max and it was him talking to dan hauser and this was like before anything was known about san andreas this was like the big reveal and it was just bizarre audio of them sitting in a room together and then you can hear dan hauser be like yeah so for this one that's gonna be my impersonation i'm gonna stick with it he's like for this one we didn't want to make a city we decided to make a state <laughs> and you get to hear like the reaction from Matt Helgus at the time like what are you talking about but like that is the epiphany of San Andreas <laughs> is the ambition of Rockstar of like oh no we can just make a whole state at this point um, I um, can I can I go off of uh, making a state yeah please make a statement uh, here's here's one of mine Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 <laughs> hell yeah <laughs> That's a good yes one. yes just for like, you know, what are we going to do? One continent? No, let's just go for the entire planet at this point. Yeah, I mean, just just the level of I this game. I don't know. Maybe it costs less than uh, we'd all assume for being a one to one scale model of the Earth. But just like the the kind of. It feels almost James Cameron y in that it's like, oh, they invented new technology like specifically for this purpose, you know, that that it's just like not only is this kind of impressive as a game, but it is like here is a technological feat that we as consumers have just never seen before. And then they put Maverick from Top Gun in it. So it got That's even right. Better. They put the, the, the supersonic like Mach 10 jet in there. <laughs> so silly. They put they got in front of Fortnite and said, nah, this one's ours. That's right. That's right. Back up. Um, I like it on the list. Um, God, there's a couple of directions. Here's the thing. Here's my question. Can it be considered an epic of gaming production past and present and future if it was not overwhelmingly positively received when it was released? I, think, I mean, yeah. that is another good question because, I mean, epic to me means like 
people widely consider it to be epic or good or something. Yeah, right? or something. Well, so here's here's the one uh, that I'd like to put on the list is Spore. I feel like Spore from Will Wright is one of the greatest blank checks in gaming history, right? And I think yeah. now, outside of that hype, I think that game rules. I understand at the time it was not the epiphany that even, you know, The Sims was, but the ambition and the scope of what they're going for for his next big project. I mean, that was really the next big project after The Sims and Sims Online. I don't know if there's anything else really in that gap where he was really leaning into it in a big way. Um, but then to, I just remember in his pitch and, you know, the famous GDC presentation and all that, but he said that the point of the game was to simulate a religious epiphany. <laughs> it's like, who else has had hundreds of millions of dollars in the game industry to try and accomplish that? Um, and you can make and like... The, a, the scope of that game just ultimately felt small to me, though. Like, you could kind of get through the life cycle of, of your creature in, like, one play session. Of right? the creature? But I wonder, like, to go from the beginning to, like, what is it, five stages? I forget. Um, to yeah. go to, like, the whole spacefaring and all that stuff. That would take some time. Yeah, you know, it's not like you're going to spend 100 hours in one run necessarily, but still, like, you get to see the scope of all of existence, Kyle. Isn't that good enough for you? I mean, if it's I, not fun. I like it. <laughs> what the hell there's that? <laughs> I was, I I like was also uh, I was also thinking about, um, you know, it's it's not it's not the biggest thing it should be judged on, but, like, for a lot of these, I was kind of trying to think about, like, pre-release hype, you know, and just kind of, like... The feeling that when Spore comes, it's going to change gaming forever. Right. Like, did it? Mm, but like, like it. Most games do not have a feeling like that when they're coming out, and it does right. seem to like speak to something about it. And, well, I think you know people made the comparison, obviously, but uh, with No Man's Sky, and that feels like one that it definitely had the scope and ambition. But that's one that's held back in my mind from like, but. The budget, I don't think they were breaking the bank to make that. I mean, obviously... Yeah, but it's like now. How much does it cost uh, total now? Right. With like five years of development <laughs> added. Yeah, I guess that's how it all evens out and stuff. But yeah, No Man's Sky is like... It's got the scope, but it doesn't have kind of that feeling of like the, the auteur, if you will, saying, no, you will give me more money and this will work. It was kind of just like an experiment that ballooned and then Sony helped get across the finish line, you know? Uh, what about what about Shenmue? I think that's an interesting one. I like that one a lot. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was absolutely one of the like gaming has changed forever moments. Um, and I mean, I think it was received better than like No Man's Sky at launch. But yeah, uh, and most expensive, right? It is. It is one of the most expensive games. Like it's still even today is somehow still in like I don't know the top fifteen or something like that. Which for you know, for a game that old, that's yeah. That's for a game where you insane. drive a forklift, <laughs> I, I think that's like a great pick. I think that's just a, an example of I, I like. You hear those stories about Resident Evil Four, which, by the way, I'm not presenting Resident Evil Four as as an option here, but like the people making it were like, "Is this? I don't think I don't know. If this is good. We're like third person. Like, I, is this okay?" And I feel like that was probably happening a lot with Shenmue, right? It's like. So it's like the pitch meeting is like, so you just spend like a month driving a forklift. That's like the game. And Suzuki is probably like, yes, yeah, that's it. And we're going to spend I mean, a lot of money on it. And we're going to, we're going to have a bunch of characters who also work there that you talk to every day. And it's like, all right, I'll, 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 I'll do some character we'll models. a hundred million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the big thing with that game is like just everything in the environment was a thing you could do something with. Like, I, it was yeah. the video game where they were like, there sh if it exists, you should be able to, like, do a thing with it. Right. And I think that's been an ambition, like, kind of forever. Like, going back to, like, text adventure games and stuff even, too. But for a full, like, you know, 3D world kind of thing, um, I mean, that was definitely like an that was an ev an ev actual evolution. I feel like. Yeah, I can only think of two games where you can walk into a store and pick up every item and look at it and decide if you want to buy it. And it's Shenmue and Red Dead Redemption Two. <laughs> 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 Clearly, an inspiration. Yeah. Um, that, that is such a weird one. It was so weird. Um, we got to visit Ben Reeves and I got to visit Yu Suzuki at YSNet. I think that's how you pronounce the name of the developer um, over said, there yeah. in Tokyo. Yeah. But I think it's YS because of Yu Suzuki. So it's weird to say East oh, or Yeast okay. or something, that you know? Um, 
But that was so weird, like, having him pitch Shenmue 3 and, like, showing the gameplay demo of Shenmue 3 because he was still in this mode, I think that was kind of a carryover from those early days where he was big on, like, look at look at the water effects on the screen. Look at the texture on his jacket. Doesn't that look amazing? Like, no offense to Shenmue 3, but it's like, no, not really. But I think just coming from that era where, like, for the pitch of Shenmue and Shenmue 2, you could literally do that. Just be like, look at the fidelity. Isn't it absurd how amazing this looks? And Shenmue 3 obviously looks better, but still just times have moved so fast that it, it doesn't really get the respect it deserves for how mind-blowing it was back in the day. Yeah, I just remember being over at my old best friend Ronnie's house when he was playing Shenmue 1, and it was always like, oh, that drawer game? Like, every time I see you play that, you're just, like, opening <laughs> drawers. Like, what the hell is that thing? Weirdly large amount of time spent in that game opening and closing <laughs> drawers. <laughs> um, you know, when you're talking about PC stuff and text adventures and stuff, it made me think of, like, is it stupid not to put World of Warcraft on this list? If we're talking about just, like, the mind-blowing things, plenty of hype going into this. It clearly cost a boatload. It was a huge risk. It's like, who, who's going to try and compete with EverQuest? Are you guys nuts? And the fact that they pulled it off to the extent that it's still... Ha- what, is there an expansion this year? The Dragonflight one? Um, the fact that it's still going since 2004. I mean, that, I think, deserves a spot on the list. It, it's funny to me that you said it. You, I never thought of that game as risky at all. Really? Like Blizzard, I don't think of as a risky developer in general. Like they, you know, like they kind of lock in and make something. And and and, and the fact that EverQuest was such a hit and this really notable developer w- is going to do try to do something like that. I don't know. And also, I remember it coming out, and I think I was even working at GameStop at the time, and it was like there was no question it was going to be a huge hit. But maybe that's just like my own perception. I've never really maybe. played. I've never played it. I don't oh. like MMOs. And maybe that like colors my perception of just, it's like, it seemed like such a sure thing from the beginning to me. But Yeah, I think where the risk comes in is like, yeah, it's easy to see that, oh, Blizzard has the formula of looking at other developers with successful games and like, hey, we'll give our Blizzard polish pass on this. And like, okay, we will take Dune 2. And now here's a very easy to play RTS. Please enjoy everybody. Or like, you know, you could even look at Overwatch in some ways um, as examples of that. But then I think the idea of like, okay, we'll look at EverQuest and we'll try and make our own version of it. But this is not your average genre. I mean, this is a genre that takes years and years and years and online infrastructure and a whole new skill set. And basically you have to develop a real huge RPG. I mean, I guess Diablo 2 existed and whatnot. The MMO conversation is just an interesting one in general because it's like i've never played this game but like every time i hear about eve online right it's like there's something happening in there that i'm like how could this you know it's like like twenty thousand people spent 17 years building this spaceship and then they blew it up in three hours (laughs) it's It's great to hear about (laughs) there's stuff that happens there that is just kind of epic on a scale that like most games don't get to. And I agree that that uh, World of Warcraft is one as well. You know, it's like if if we were still playing Overwatch and not Overwatch 2 or whatever in like 2035, I think we would have to say, well, Overwatch, you know, one one of the most like biggest, most influential, whatever. Um, Yeah, Uh, yeah, uh, World of Warcraft signed with me. Great. Love it. Um, On that Eve front, I was thinking like Star Citizen is an interesting one, That's, but it's just, it's so tough to grade. Is that like, a game? What are, when, yeah, you, are, when you go like to the Wikipedia the of most check. expensive games, you know, <laughs> Star Citizen yeah. is at the top. No, you're right, Kelsey. It is full blank check territory. You're right. I, I, that's why I'm I'm still a little confused as to our, our criteria here because it seems like everything is like a factor in this, but none is the actual definition. <laughs> so like, is it the blank check part? Is it the, you know, influence yeah. on history part? Is it the, that it, like was an evolution in yeah. video yeah. games. Yeah, Kelsey, don't you know that... how sites and podcasts make lists? You just vaguely <laughs> define the terms and then say full steam ahead, and whatever happens, happens. Uh, can I? Can this I? This way, we make everybody one? mad. That's right. That's right. That's the exactly. goal of every podcast. Um, okay, I'm I'm kind of pandering to Hanson here, but I'm Uh-oh. also obsessed with this uh, Metal Gear Solid Four. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah, that was a key one for me. That's on my list for sure. Yeah, Kyle mentioned that uh, when we talked about it in the Monday meeting. He's like, oh, like Metal Gear Solid 4. Why 4 in particular, Jacob? I mean, because it's like, you can't do 5 because it's incomplete. And, <sighs> and also, 4 is uh, 
four is the more out there one you know like yeah. like five five is fun to play the entire time and and so it doesn't feel as like and four four starts with live action commercials and ends with an hour and a half cutscene of a wedding and an <laughs> old guy killing an even older guy neither of which have shown up through the entire game uh, like it's just it's just a it's a blank checkier game and you know, we've I talked mean, about the, in the, the commercials yeah. are what does it for me that, the that is just insane like, like if you're not familiar they're basically i don't know like movie budget level live action series of commercials developed that just show in the front of the game for i don't know what two minutes yeah you can, you can kind flip, of flip through, through the a bunch channel of them. and yep when i played it i didn't even know you could flip through them so i just watched one and yeah i was like i don't have any clue what that has to do with the rest of the game and it's totally a non sequitur it's and it's like looks just absurdly expensive. <laughs> it's yeah, it's insane. There's something about that about like it's kind of the climax for Kojima's power in a way. You know, maybe Metal Gear Solid Five cost more, but the fact that this one was like also tying up storylines in such a big way, and that was the goal, and that it was so weird at the same time, I think is an argument to be made. Um, Kelsey, do you have more suggestions? With your all-seeing mind throughout all of history? <laughs> With my all-seeing mind. Um, I mean, it, to keep going the Kojima route, and especially if we're doing blank check, Death Stranding, I think right? I mean, that, that was a literal, like, yeah. do whatever you want. Here you go. Yeah, and the fact that they managed to release that as quickly as they did, I think it's still mind-boggling. Like, I thought we would still be waiting for Death Stranding, but it's like, oh, no, we're going to announce it, and then a couple years, actually, it comes out on time. No big deal. Um, yeah, it's definitely in that blank checky territory. Um, it, speaking of recent releases, is Elden Ring in this discussion for the most epic games Weirdly ever made? No, is that it? I I feel like it might be. Why is that, Kyle? I think it's just I, really good. I don't know that it's like. Yeah. I don't know that it's like this is the first time they've been able to make something. I, I don't know. Again, maybe I'm just getting I mean, caught up with the is, definition here, but it feels like a FromSoft game. Just yeah. more I, I do of, think there's the thing of like it, when it when it first came out, you know, both Kyle and I and everyone else saying like, oh, this is Dark Souls four and five, you know, just in terms of like the scale of it right. is, I think bigger than anyone and, and when when they you know they were like uh oh, it's gonna be like 40 hours long pre-release and then you get it and it's like 120 um Psych. but i also yeah i guess it it feels like it's like well they did it really well before and they did it again even though elden ring is in some way such a departure it's just like you know yep from from keep nailing their thing but we're talking about the know. most if we're just going off that word just the most epic games ever released awe inspiring things i mean yeah i get but it's i it i again it's kelsey's well presented issue of like <laughs> we don't really know what the list is In my head it was like the yeah. games that just feel like just insane off the rails budget even breath yeah. of the wild a game mm-hmm. that is hugely epic doesn't feel like there was some crazy auteur making insane decisions that cost millions right. of dollars right right where you know, Metal Gear Solid Four is almost to me the best example of that of just like just just a lunatic spending Konami's money for three four years. I like that. There needs <laughs> and to be we a, get to play it. There needs to be a level of lunacy for like what what are you yes. all doing? Yeah, How, yeah. That it shouldn't it shouldn't be like the the decisions cannot all be logical. Yes, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. right. Um, <laughs> Destiny. Yeah, that was. That Expensive? was another one I kind of Expensive? mentioned when we were first talking about this, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it has that element of lunacy. I mean, it's got wizards from the moon, but... It's just, it's like, I feel like a live service game just, like, can't count. And maybe this is, you know, it's, <laughs> my, it's my own, like, you know, preconceived biases or whatever. But it's just, like, it's, like... I don't know. When, when the game is just, like, built to be, like, yep, people will be buying dlc packs for this for 10 years to come it just doesn't feel quite as like doesn't that mean mmos me. can't mmos right can't no count that's, either. that's what i'm <laughs> trying to figure out in my own <laughs> schema here. or like just the first i mean i think you could almost say that like the concept of big live service games you know whatever we we choose destiny might be a good one to choose uh, as like the defining 
live service game, like that's the one that that did it and was insane and pushed it forward or whatever. But then you can't just go with all live service yeah. games because they're they probably all are. I mean, not all, but a yeah. lot of them are insane in budget and scope. And yeah, I'm I mean, to- that's definitely that's like the Halo people. They're what are they doing next? We don't. We, Activision's like. Sh- do whatever, man. Like, right. From the makers <laughs> the of Halo Call of Duty people. and Halo. Well, that's the thing. I don't, I don't know how much lunacy is involved in Destiny. Like, if you were to say, yeah. There's some uh, lunar. That's exactly. Yeah, well, look, we already hit the V. We got it. But, like, that idea of, oh, the Halo team, they're going to make a game that's kind of like an MMO. It's like, that sounds about right for where we're at in the industry to be released in 2014 eventually. Um, but then again, I think it's saying, hey, we're going to have an MMO-ish game on the console and it's going to succeed in a big way. I mean, that's it definitely changed the industry in a huge way. Um, so I guess that's where the lunacy comes in is assuming that they thought they could pull this off. And they basically did through a lot of stress. <laughs> um, can I just throw out yeah. some that I don't don't necessarily should think or think should be included. But just I have Super Smash Bros with a question mark written down because okay. I don't know which one it would be. My instinct was Brawl for some reason, just because that one feels kind of it's like like those subspace emissary cutscenes <laughs> feel oh, that's, so yeah. they're absurd. Yeah, you know, but it's like ultimate would probably be the one. Um, also, absolutely not because it's held in critical high esteem. But uh, Detroit Become Human always feels like a game that it's like how. Who let this person <laughs> yeah. spend this much <laughs> money on one. this game? One, I mean, actually, I'm in the honestly. camp of yeah for Beyond Two Souls. Like that's my first experience right. of like that, holy that one might be the more. <laughs> it's outrageous. Yeah, but something I, I so, it's like a good fit. Yeah, uh, you know, it's like I think Quantic Dream makes bad games, but like you know they they sure spend a lot of money on them. And you know what? <laughs> I mean, are you feeling strongly about Detroit Become Human beyond f- over Beyond Two Souls? Because now Beyond no, Two Souls Beyond is, is totally fine with me. Yeah, uh, Kelsey, did you ever play Beyond Two Souls? No, I've not. It's still somehow one of the best looking games ever made. It is the most ridiculous production, and it's all about David Cage wrestling with the afterlife, but just pouring so much money into this PlayStation production. And like you know, the one chapter that we're obsessed with and we streamed back at Game Informer and stuff, I just still can't get over it, is there's like this two to three hour chapter around halfway in the game, maybe later on in the game, where it's just the main character and she's on like this ranch and dealing with like the Navajo tribe. And it is the most absurd, over-the-top thing. It's like, oh, now in this chapter she can ride a horse, and it's like the best-looking horse you've ever seen in any video game ever. And this entire chapter is building with the storyline of the ghosts and how the Navajo also experienced ghosts. It is the most easily cuttable, yet expensive tra- chapter I've ever seen in any video game ever. It is the most unnecessary thing, and they just spent years of their lives and tens and tens of millions of dollars just to have this absurd scene in the American Southwest. Um, I, good one. I do, I kind of like that game. If you put a gun to my head, I think I would say that I like Beyond Two Souls. It's so messed <laughs> you up. Really talk it's talk about so, it a lot. It's so bizarre, but it really stuck with me. Um, it, other contenders we could throw on the list? Um, uh, what, should, should we say Cyberpunk? Like, should that just oh, that's interesting. get thrown yeah. in yeah. the pile? I think that's, that's pileable. Yeah. I, I mean, the fact that. that they got like an A-list actor, right, to be in like this what 60 hour experience right he's, yeah it's not yeah. like a cameo he's not like a second he's not samuel jackson in san andreas who is an important character but you know shows up once every couple of hours like yeah. keanu reeves is there the whole time like kojima couldn't even get Kiefer sutherland to like commit to that kind of video <laughs> well game, we don't know. know that but yeah that seems about I, right. I think we do. I played Metal Gear Solid <laughs> 5. I mean, he spoke like four times. I just remember talking to the voice director for that interview back at Game Informer. She's like, no, we got him exactly as much as we wanted him. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I guess she's just lying to my face then. Yeah. I don't know. Could be. Look, it's a tough business out there. Um, okay, I like it. Other thoughts? Other ones we could um, throw in there? It, it, any of... I mean, Final Fantasy Seven. both of them? Oh, ooh. Ooh. God, yeah, Kelsey, which yeah, one would you actually, go with? I would, I, I would actually kind of lean remake. I kind of would too. 
I mean, the the original is I only say the original because it is on that list of like adjusted for inflation. It's really near the top of like most expensive games. Right. But I agree that the remake feels like it cost one billion dollars. <laughs> and also it has the be, lunacy factor. It, yeah. I mean, we don't know how much it's going to cost. <laughs> yes, that's true. Right? Right. <laughs> yeah, it has so much lunacy. They couldn't contain it in one game. So this thing is a 10 year stretch of them just swinging so hard for the fences and going off the rails in the most bizarre way god ooh, how do i not think of that jacob keller what that's <laughs> perfect uh okay the list right now we have one more to oh, add yeah, please. I, but i do because i just want to talk about it but i don't think it'll be like a major contender but um assassin's creed 2 in particular okay feels like you know it's kind of like one was like all right we pulled that off and then we're gonna we're gonna two it's like we're going to make a digital version of the Renaissance. You're going to, this is like the beginning of a trilogy. The game literally opens. You're playing as Ezio as a baby. Like you press buttons to control Ezio's like <laughs> arms and legs. It is, as a baby. It's an epic and like, a, yeah, in like a literature sense. Yeah. Like you, you go through his entire life. Yeah. And it's like, I feel like Assassin's Creed two is just like, yeah, one was a hit. Let's throw everything at the wall for two is kind of how I felt about Assassin's Creed two in particular. Yeah. No, I think that's an interesting contender. Okay. So, the the danglers we got smash brawl breath of the wild maybe not so much we're saying kyle yeah, uh did you become a so, human yeah. not so much okay so a list of contenders for the five most epic games ever made um red Dead redemption 2 max Payne 3 super mario brothers ocarina of time gta san andreas microsoft flight simulator 2020 spore shenmue world of warcraft Metal Gear solid 4 death stranding elden ring destiny beyond two souls cyberpunk 2077 final fantasy 7 remake assassin's creed 2 was i missing any a long list <laughs> yeah, if we had to choose five, I, we start with some lots. And I yeah. still feel like yeah. we're we're missing some like old PC oh, stuff. Oh yes, Probably, yeah. yep. It's like oh, you didn't get free <laughs> like Ultima Four or something. Like yeah. I just I can't speak to it enough. Star Control. I'm sure like you know those those fans are, are screaming, and we apologize to them. Um, uh, yeah, let's let's go for locks. Uh, there's not a world where Red Dead Redemption Two is not on this list. Yeah, I, I think I agree yeah. with that. Okay. The other the other lock for me, which I did not bring to the table, Kelsey, but Shenmue. I feel yeah, like honestly, I, think so. I feel like that one's a lock. Yeah, I think, I think you're that's right. a really good one. I think you're right. Um I think Kelsey's right, not me. Kelsey. No, Kyle. I think you're <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I think in I'm particular. right too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um a late late comer, I think Fantasy Seven Remake is a very interesting contender for this list in terms of just leaning into it and it is so high on the lunacy and the budget end of the spectrum. But, I mean, it's kind of a safe bet if you had to... I guess, yeah, I guess yeah. the only the only hesitation I have is, like, that that there are going to be three of them. You know, like, it kind of... The fact that it's, like, you're playing the first third of something, I think, makes it feel a little less... Uh, you know, like the biggest game in the world. Um, it's interesting because that's actually what's selling it for me as being on this list. It's like we're not even okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we want to say our teeth into this just one. kind of right. the, the remake cinematic universe. Like if like all kind of or just the project is what is on the list. That's fine with me. Yeah, I think it is that it, you see the level of detail they went into just for Midgar, and it's like, are you all aware? how much there is in the game beyond just Midgar. And this is the level of detail you're going with. It is truly bananas. Um, Kyle? Yeah, Metal Gear Solid 4 is my Kojima pick. Yeah. Even even in the face of Death Stranding, I feel like Metal Gear Solid 4 is yeah. like the, the I like crazier that. one. I like the that. The more ridiculous one. Kelsey, I mean, there's like sequences where it's just like digitized eggs being cooked on screen <laughs> for like two minutes. Like it's... <laughs> Are they even digital? It might even be no, live I think action. No, I think it's live egg action cooked. eggs. Well, but there's <laughs> that one on. part where, like, the two embryos, like, come together, though. So they're, yeah, like, so it's animated like, it's eggs. Yeah, so it's, like, movie-quality CGI eggs <laughs> <For cooking laughs> going to <together>. eggs. <laughs> uh, come on. That's just good gaming. Kelsey, I, I want Super Mario Brothers on this list. I think it's a cool choice. If you had to, to pick another one like to it. try and lock in, maybe a fifth and final one, Kelsey, which way would you go? Oh, I don't know. Um, I want... I feel like Super Mario Brothers belongs on a list like this. I don't know that this one is defined well enough that I could 
defended against every what definition. What are you confused about, Kelsey? Kelsey, it's very <laughs> clear. How many times must we not explain it? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I really am not trying to like no, no, keep you're hammering so on to that. I just like there's you're 100% multiple reads right. of this. <laughs> yeah. And I think it fits super well for some reads of yeah, this, but you're not right. like I, I feel like now I'm going for like which of the many definitions which games fit into like most of those right right <laughs> i mean here's here's my argument it'd be a weird entry on this list Uh-oh. <laughs> and it's technically correct nobody would think of it except for a mind like kelsey lewin i think it's a cool one to have as the fifth just to really make it seem so when we're judged by the view of history that it'll seem like we really thought through this list <laughs> I, I also think you made a good argument for it. Like, I didn't really know that backstory. I just sort of thought Mario Brothers appeared out of Miyamoto's brain one day. And they're like, yeah, that seems fine. We'll publish that. But I didn't know the backstory of it being like, this is the, the this has to be the ultimate. And it and they saw it as the finish line. And it ended up being the starting line. Is, right. is kind of why. Yeah. yeah, I think that's cool. Yeah. All right, everybody. The top five most epic games of all time very <laughs> clearly are Final Fantasy VII Remake, Metal Gear Solid 4, Guns of the Patriots, Shenmue 1, Super Mario Brothers, and Red Dead Redemption 2. Find us a better list online. We dare ya. Oh, I mean, we could we could put Beyond Two Souls on there if we want to get that those comments on YouTube. <laughs> Look, we, we gave wanna, it to put it in the thumbnail. <laughs> all right, in the put, thumbnail. Put Willem Dafoe's face in the thumbnail. <laughs> He's actually hiding in most MinMax thumbnails if you look carefully. It's kind of like a little <laughs> Easter egg arrangement we have, Roland. Uh, hey, uh, there's this game called Roller Drum, which is out now on PlayStation and it's out on PC and stuff. We talked about it with Leo Vader. He's Gaga over this thing as well. Um, so the easy pitch for Roller Drum, as it was explained to, to me, I think Game Informer described it this way as well. It's like, oh, it's uh, Tony Hawk, but with guns. Um, and so I think going into it, I wasn't expecting it to be as much where it's like, oh, no, it's Tony Hawk meets Max Payne <laughs> is kind of the weird fusion of what's going on here. Um, Jacob Keller, how would you describe what Roller Drome is? Yeah, well, so I, my entry point is interesting because I've never played a Tony Hawk. I, I, I have like what? no experience Ever? with kind of games where you do tricks. No, it's really uh, at a friend's house. I mean, I like I have I have touched a controller that was playing Tony Hawk, exactly. but I've like I've never exactly. I've never like been even like competent at one before. And so my first reaction is like, wow, my fingers have to touch a lot of buttons at the same time because it like it, <laughs> yeah. it wants you to like do a grab and flip and slow down time and, and shoot then dodge at the same enemy time. bullets at the same time. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot going on there. Um, and so it's like it it's. I am finding it really interesting in that, like, I'm good at slow motion shooting games, uh, but this is like asking for a new skill set from me, which uh, which I find really exciting. But yeah, it's it's great. It's I know I know that I'm into a game when it gives me the opportunity to replay a level instead of going to the next one. And I choose to replay it because right. I know that I can do it better. And and Roller Drome is totally hitting those buttons of like i i pretty sure i can string together a longer combo than that let me just like give it another shot um yeah i'm curious yeah. since kyle and i only played kind of the the opening sections of this game like how does it evolve it, does he feel like it's constantly adding stuff on or you kind of get the cool mechanics I mean, of the I, gameplay? so i have only done the first four or five maps so i'm still not super far into it but it's like they add new enemies um and the the maps get more uh complex like you in in the first map particularly it's like you don't really need to know where you're going it's just kind of smooth half pipes everywhere yeah. uh, but as it goes on the geometry gets more complicated and so you really have to like have you need to understand your line like i'm going to go from here to there to there um, so it definitely feels like it's getting uh, harder and and more interesting. Yeah, Kyle, you digging it so far? Yeah, I am. I the thing, like the thing that I want from it uh, to like really get me like totally in and see it to the end is actually like the weird story that it's established. It's like 
it's kind of like a running man situation right. which honestly it's not a movie i'm like super familiar with or novel i guess but um i like the weird future retro future kind of like fascist a government that's in place like that's making these games happen like that stuff's like really interesting happening in the background and then it is it's like i i almost had to untrain my tony hawk brain to like you can just land like you can yeah. just be full spinning and you're fine and it's like it doesn't matter and that makes it more fun and like the dodging the sniper attacks is another like mechanic that's like implemented in a really simple way they're not hard to dodge those shots and because of that it's like really satisfying to be like jumping up in the air doing a slow motion shot dodging a sniper and then you can just land even if you're spinning like it's fun it's just it really like it helps you along in a big way. They could have made it more like Tony Hawk and made it harder to land. Like maybe you get more bullets by like landing a more complicated trick. But I like that. It's just I like, it. nah, spin forever. Tap that R1 button a couple times. You'll get more bullets. Have at it. Like it's it's really smooth. Yeah, I'm really with you. It's like I've been craving to go back to Tony Hawk and I actually did not too long ago. And I was like, ah, I'm not as good as I used to be at this game. But then going into this, like, oh, here's a Tony Hawk where you can't fall. And also there's the yeah. added challenge of dodging bullets and shooting these enemies around the map and stuff like that. Like, it's really satisfying. And it's just such a stupid, ridiculous video game thing that somehow very quickly seems very natural. Like, no, no, you do tricks and then you hear the reload sound of a gun because that's how you reload your ammo. <laughs> it's like, oh, of course, yeah, tricks for reloading. Okay, I, I know video games. I got it. And it's just... it. it all works out beautifully. That's um, like how you shoot off screen in a in an arcade shooter. Yeah, right. to reload. Yep. Like, let me add more bullets by removing bullets. That's... I have never thought about that. Yeah, it's the implication <laughs> that you're putting your gun off the screen and then like shoving more bullets into it, but it's just not animated. It's unclear. Um, also, Kyle, you must be a fan of the intro for this game, where it like starts in first person. You're in like I thought of Kyle too. <laughs> and then you walk out in your first arena, and then the big text on the screen where it says "Roller Drum." That's your oh yeah, it's in the button. thread. Go check out the Twitter thread. The Roller Drum screenshot is on there as of last awesome. night. It awesome. was a frantic like, oh crap, I gotta hit the share button. <laughs> like that's amazing. <laughs> the Twitter thread. I um attacked viciously uh, as dusk falls a little while ago for being like 80 gigabytes. Yeah. Uh, I want to uh, go in the other direction. This game is less than a gigabyte. What? No. <laughs> That's when like I downloaded Nintendo. it on PS5, at least the download size, I don't know, expanded, but the download size was like 800 megabytes. Okay, so that's why I think it deserves a spot on the most epic games of all time <laughs> on the list. I, I just, think... just want to point it out because that it's is kind of crazy. Yeah, as a person who is not a developer, I want to make that very clear, I don't think there's really any textures in the game because it's all just like flat colors. I guess, yeah, it's a yeah. cell shading style. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Maybe it looks great. It looks great. Like it looks, yeah. yeah, it's kind of like a, a sable look almost, you know? Yeah. But uh, Jacob, really drum... it, would be, it would be fun for you to play some uh, Tony Hawk remake like just play like an hour of it. I would love to hear what it's like for someone totally new to revisit. The only one I want to play is the one where you have the actual board that you can stand on and do tricks. Ride. That's it. (laughs) Yeah. All right. We can make that work. Um, Do you have any sense? (laughs) I know I ask this all the time, but I don't know how else to close out talking about a podcast or talking about a game on a podcast, but do you have any sense, Jacob? I mean, is this one of your favorite games of the year? Is it going to crack your top 10? Where are you feeling right now about it? I think so. I mean, kind of a light year so far but i i think the story is going to be cool uh like i've only experienced two story sections so far but they have both been just like pretty pretty sparse but really neat um and i can imagine that continuing and uh yeah it's fun as hell fun as hell roller drone everybody uh speaking of fun as hell uh kyle you're excited to talk about a game that i don't i should be more glued into but jetpack joyride 2 what truly one of my favorite mobile games. Yeah. I mean, when did that first game come out? Like 2011, 2012? 2011. Yeah. Wow. Um, and this yeah. thing is out and it's an Apple Arcade joint? So it comes out uh, Friday. Okay. Which I, I guess the 19th. Uh, so I have it a little early. Um, and it's it's the big thing about it is it's not an endless runner anymore. It is what? a game. It has levels and it has bosses. And because it's an Apple Arcade game, there's no microtransactions or ads or anything. Yeah. So it feels like... Uh, it's a weird thing to say, but it feels like a proper game. Like I don't, you're not cornered into like buying things to upgrade yourself. And because of that, like it feels good. Like imagine playing Jetpack Joyride, but every time you 
finish, you know, playing a, a round or whatever, yeah. you get to go like upgrade your weapons and upgrade your jetpack. And I have this factory that's like a- always generating coins for me that I can just check in and on every now and then. And like, there's all these like upgrades. There's like, there's like these like weird light RPG mechanics. And then the core game is like, it's very familiar jetpack joyride gameplay where you're going down a hallway and you're just trying to like, you know, boost yourself up to like avoid obstacles. And then yeah. the big change for two is, um, enemies will come in and you can shoot them, which you just shoot automatically. It doesn't really change how you're interacting with the game. You just want to make sure you're lined up with the enemies to shoot them. Right. And uh, I, I'm really digging it so far. Like both said, both as just like an, a bit of a nostalgic thing because it was like, it was huge in 2011, like yeah. in the Game Informer office. Like you, me, and Dan were sort of like high so score fun. fighting. And I've just really enjoyed like revisiting that. And I like that it's a, a game with a campaign. Like it has an ending and there are bosses that I'm fighting and I'm really enjoying it for that reason. I'm trying to figure out how it makes me feel. Because like, oh, it's great. There's no microtransactions. Then again, there's kind of the ultimate microtransaction because I have to get an Apple Arcade subscription again to play this. Right. Yes. Like I, I, yeah. It seems absurd but in my heart i'm like well i wish it was just like a free-to-play game that i could ignore the microtransactions but i can't ignore or if you could just pay five dollars for it right so you would, know I would, mobile games used to work i would yeah. love to even pay 20 bucks for this thing but i just i know i'm not going to play the rest of the apple arcade stuff like i had that subscription for a while and i enjoyed playing oregon trail and fantasian on it but like I, I just don't think yeah, I'm going mean, to play the rest of it. stuff on there, but I totally understand that hurdle. Like, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Kelsey, do you play any um, games on your phone? Uh, just Pikmin Bloom. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. <laughs> Which I think I am, like, the only person playing. Oh, except Leo, right? Yep, Leo, Leo plays it. Leo Pikmin. loves it. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, I'm not really playing a lot of mobile games um, because they just they take up so much I, I just get so distracted and I don't play the games I like actually want to be playing if right. I'm playing anything on my phone. I don't know why that is weird. Like this is the smallest screen and I, I am dedicated to my smallest screen. I don't I don't know. I redownloaded into the breach and it's destroying my wife. Like I, I'm playing it on my phone and it's like I should not have done it. It's, I'm losing hours. <laughs> at least that one you feel I smarter. You regret this decision. <laughs> like, I feel like you'd feel smarter at the end of a session of playing Into the Breach. You know, it's not just like the most mindless cookie clicker yeah. crap or whatever on your phone. Uh, yeah. How is Pikmin Bloom? Kelsey, how's that game I, flowering? I really love the games that like I'm not supposed to stare at a lot and I they they encourage something else so like a lot of the Niantic games are like that I feel like so, yeah. um and Pikmin especially where it's more just like you should walk more and you should walk further and to more interesting places but you don't need to like stare at your phone all the time you don't have a bunch of like a million daily tasks you need to do on your phone um uh, there's not, there's some of that there's always some of that in, right. in these mobile games but like I I can't do a game where um, like I was into the Animal Crossing Pocket Camp game for a while and that was gross. just like chore after chore after like it, it was it, it was a job an obligation yeah yes right, exactly right. yeah but who can not love a game that gently nudges you every once in a while to be like hey walk to some interesting places that's like all right, yeah there's Pikmin exactly Bloom. yeah, yeah that's such a and plus idea. now there's Pikmin with little skateboards what um, one of the little decorations you can get on your Pikmin so. If you, had yeah, to, highly if, recommend. if you had to guess, what will the exact date be when I go to GameSpot.com and there's an article that says Pikmin Bloom is shutting down? What What is that day? Oh, God. It's With like... my byline. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> His I don't line. feel like it's uh, it's super long for this world. I went to... There was a, a, a Pikmin Bloom community day in Seattle um, this last weekend. Oh, and the Emerald City. A, yeah, yeah, the Emerald City. Um fantastically stupid story because they were like okay it's um we're gonna have like people there and they're gonna be giving out little you know little pikmin tchotchkes if you show up and show that you're playing the game and you've walked a certain amount of steps and stuff um it's at woodland park so there's a woodland park and then there's a woodland park zoo um anyways long story short it ended up being inside the zoo so i had to pay 27 dollars to go to this little kiosk to get my little paper pikmin hat and my (laughs) My postcard and my little enamel pin, and the true uh, microtransaction. Yeah, <laughs> and we been, it was it was me and a couple of friends, and we had been like we had been walking and like looking for it and wandering and like talking to other 
people playing the game who also looked confused and like it was it was total like sunk cost fallacy at that point we're like well we've already walked like ten thousand <laughs> steps we've walked around the entirety of woodland park at this point we should just go into the zoo and have a nice zoo day but like they totally <laughs> they got us they got us for 27 bucks each to like go in there and get our stupid pigman hats that's diabolical so, i'm, I'm kind of mad about it i get it you should be outraged um hey jacob do you want to talk about midnight fed express yeah i don't need to talk about it for very hey, man, long as long um, as you want uh, look we're we're all familiar with uh nathan fielder's legendary stunt dumb starbucks that's right the um, finest i would like to present uh dumb sifu a midnight fight express <laughs> <laughs> okay okay i'm listening uh, it's it is i mean honestly it is it is maybe more similar to something like hotline miami in terms of perspective you know it's like it's a top-down brawler where you just go through a bunch of levels um it has, in some ways, a pretty in-depth uh, fighting system where there are, you know, there are combos, you can grab people, you can, you know, parry their weapons. Um, but it's just like, it's it's an aggressively dumb game, just in terms <laughs> of, like, story. It, it constantly does the thing where it's like, there's not even really a joke, there's just, like, a reference to something. Like, there's a guy named, like um dialer turden and it's like oh, that's perfect. that's it you know perfect. like that, it doesn't go farther than that it's just like there is a character named that um but the game is really fun it it does it is not unlike sifu you don't have to like try and get good um you can just kind of like go through and throw sledgehammers at people and like you know tackle them and shoot them with electric bullets and it's just like i played through the whole thing i had a good time i'm probably never gonna think about it again <laughs> yeah i remember we well, did finish it i finished it yeah wow okay wow i love that um yeah i remember like with that last trailer I forget what showcase it was shown at but it was one of just like the most confusing pedigree splashes on the screen where it says from the writer of destiny 2 and it's like okay interesting and it was like from the stunt man of god of war it's like okay <laughs> like that's an odd combination but sure i mean all right you know pedigree's pedigree yeah, so it's I mean like it's it's it if if you like those kind of games where you just like walk into a room and they start playing some like extremely heavy electro music and you just like beat up forty guys, that's what this is, and it like does it pretty well. Okay. And, and right. for me that is like a you know, that that is a, a part of gaming that I enjoy. <laughs> there we go. Midnight Fight Express, everybody. Um, and then uh, also, uh, there's a game that came out earlier this year that it seems very up my alley, and I'm sorry I haven't gotten to it yet, but not for broadcast. I I was going to ask if you had heard of this. I this have, is, yeah. It's not dumb Sifu. It's a, oh. it's a really cool game. So not for broadcast is... Um, it is kind of similar to something like Five Nights at Freddy's because the whole thing that you do in the game is look at a uh, interface... Um, you know, like you're not moving around and you're not doing stuff. You play as like the producer of a cable news show. And so the things that you can do are like change the camera angle, censor things, uh, look out for interference on 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 the station and like play ads. Um, but the whole the cable news show is FMV. It's real people acting and they actually have like four different camera angles at all times That's and cool. so you are you're like producing a new show and so they're on the most simple level it's just like keep the camera pointed at who is talking which can be challenging sometimes when there are like lots of people on the screen and like sometimes they swear and and the you know the broadcast is on a delay and so you have to censor like at the appropriate time and all that is just like fun and interesting in itself. Yeah. Um, and then they continue. It's it's like broadly satirical. It's funny. There's things like you're covering a sports game and there's streakers at the sports game. And so you have to keep switching to cameras that are not <laughs> pointed at naked people. Perfect. Um, Perfect. And it's like and it's a real video of like people running around. Um, and then it I don't I don't want to like spoil things about the story, but like it goes in some very dark and unexpected places uh and again you're you're like watching people do this kind of live 
and it's just like it's really interesting it's i i it's kind of like it's making fmv work for it in a way that i have seen almost no other game do because of how removed you are from like what's actually going on right right yeah i i am excited about this just like some weird nostalgia about working at a community tv station it's like oh i think this will kind of feel like that again this sounds great i i am really curious like how you know how the experience would translate because to me it feels like hey i'm actually kind of doing this uh (laughs) but maybe maybe i'm not i'm sure you are um but yeah so uh not for broadcast but it's just out on pc right now um yeah is it doable on a console do you think um maybe it would um i'm i'm sure it is uh but but like you're kind of you're sitting with like a keyboard in front of you in the game almost and so right. it just plays very naturally like that but it's like five nights at freddy's is on consoles i'm yeah. sure yeah um so also cool. uh it, it it certainly would be rated m um you know so maybe that's a reason that they have not uh brought it both in terms of swearing and like subject matter yeah i mean would nintendo allow full nudity of people streaking across a baseball field <laughs> you, or whatever? you don't or... see full nudity i should say oh really how, yeah. do, how does that work? It's just like butts. How do you cut? No, I mean it's like they really get like into pixelated. it. Jacob. Ben wants to know. <laughs> yeah, it's, explain they're, what a nude like, body looks like. They're pixelated on the screen oh, that you okay. are seeing, but but the implication is like I don't know. They're not for the viewers, and so you're still trying to not. <laughs> They've already them. pre-censored it for you. You don't. Yeah. What do you, why do you have to do anything? <laughs> yeah. Stop censoring our games, everybody. Show us streakers <laughs> and more games. <laughs> just in the background. Throw them anywhere. Um, okay, Kelsey, the time has come. The bells are sounding. Um, it is time to finally talk about Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Now, oh my God. full disclaimer, disclosure, all this stuff. Um, this is a big game, and I am not very far at all, and Kelsey has also has not finished this, so grant us oh, yeah, everybody. I'm, I'm really not all that far into it um especially for a xenoblade game right i am currently very obsessed with it and like am gonna be steamrolling through it as fast as i can during two conventions but uh (laughs) yeah like there's definitely still more to see so i don't know that this is like a complete formed opinion but i can give you the impressions i have for you know the first 12 hours of the game okay. 15 hours of the game something like that yeah i'm like more. three and a half hours in i mean you're obsessed with it enough oh, okay. to like it's like it's derailed your love of live alive now you're all in on xenoblade i mean yeah i haven't finished live alive Damn yet it, i've been i'm sorry i'm co- i'm going I'm trying. <laughs> no take your time <laughs> take your time savor it it's the best um but yeah xenoblade chronicles 3 um so here's the thing i i feel like this message was not getting out in a big way. And I don't know if I blame Nintendo or listen or blame other podcasts I listen to or whatever, but like, first of all, it's not as huge as I was bracing for. I mean, Xenoblade Chronicles 1, I easily put in over 100 hours, and at least according to like how long to beat for Xenoblade Chronicles 3, they're like, oh, if you main path it, it's like 45 to 55 hours is what they say. Does anyone just not do side quests in a Xenoblade game? I'm kind of tempted to avoid them. Like, I did a couple in my time so far, and it's like, okay, I could help these people over here, but is it naive just to think that I'll be okay if I just streamline this thing? So from, I feel like, and like based on previous Xenoblade games and based on what I've read about this one, there's uh, there's always like side quests that are very very world and character building mm. that like you I mean yeah you can finish the game and it's probably still good and everything but you're going to care a lot more about the game if you put some time into those I mean you know there's always there's also always like the dumb fetch quest ones right, and like right. gather a bunch of glitter radishes or whatever but um yeah I I think that to get through the game in 45 50 hours feels like you're probably missing a lot um i'm i assume i'm putting at least 100 into this one yeah that's probably the right attitude to have i should get out of my mindset of thinking that i can blast through this thing but the other thing that i feel like it wasn't messaged well is like and i'm sure this will come into play at some point later on but from everything i've heard and seen so far in the game it's like don't worry if you've never played xenoblade chronicles 1 or xenoblade chronicles 2 like i think it's going to 
I think there's going to be things that will probably connect them, but I think it's going to be more subtle than you think. And it is picking up a whole new storyline. And on top of that, I think it's a really, really compelling opening to this game, at least. I'm curious to see where it goes. But like, even if you're somebody like me who loves old JRPGs and stuff, but sometimes the storytelling in modern JRPGs is just kind of grating. Like, I think the opening of this game really works. It has a really interesting setup and it moves pretty quick. This is the most I have been excited about a JRPG story in a while because it it is it does actually feel like very fresh and like a story I haven't heard told before. Right. Which is, you know, no spoilers here, but just for the opening setting of what's happening in this game. All right, Jacob, get ready. Expand I'm your ready. brain to this one. So there's warring factions. In this Sounds world. Sounds pretty familiar already. Yeah, but hang on. What if I told no, you... No, that's never been done. United that's States. never been that's done, Kyle. <laughs> guess. One of them lost their memory. How dare you? You're insulting <laughs> the good name of Xenoblade. No, it's warring factions. I, I have, I, just uh, to be uh, optimistic for a second, I actually have heard the beginning is amazing. And it it's has cool. made me want to at least start it. So, yes. Please continue. So the premise is there's these warring factions, and it's a group of young people, basically kids, and they're all child soldiers, and the entire premise is you only live for 10 years. You basically have a 10 year term where all you have to do is fight this opposing faction. And believe it or not, Jacob, I learned a situation of like, hey, don't ask too many questions about what's going on here. You fight for 10 years. And then there's somebody called, was it the, the seer? What are they called again? Uh, what the the queen or the offseers? The offseers, you- yes. Then the offseers will vanish you, and you'll kind of go to the afterlife. So everybody, it's just like this weird environment of it. Basically, feels kind of like a high school or college like they, story. Are they children or are they it's, born like? So they're they're born like ten years old, basically. Okay, right. So, so they're, they're you, you can make it to life. like a max. Yeah, yeah. It's a very convenient way to get what, around. What like, why is everybody a teenager thing? Um, yeah, they, they're born like probably about 10 years old and then they live to a maximum of 20 years old. But most people die in war before that. And it's like very exciting if you make it your entire 10 years. Yeah, but just like trying to wrap my mind around this world and like, how are they seeing their death? You know, is anybody deeply disturbed by this? And believe it or not, you know, some storylines bubble up and stuff around that. But it's just this fascinating idea. And even just small stuff like you know it's like men and women and i guess there's a bunch of different uh species and stuff that are technically fighting as well but then early on there's like a a bath scene you'll like it jacob geller with all your pervy games that you're playing with all the nudity oh i love but it i just love it because like okay they're all just soldiers and everyone's just like bathing and showering together and it's just like completely normal it's just like an asexual world we all are just existing to fight the enemy and it's kind of a cool thing if you make it to 10 years but not the end of the world if you don't Right, it's a very Our like troopers. yeah <laughs> yep it, it, yeah, absolutely honestly that's a good comparison yeah it's i mean it's just a kind of an interesting like you know you have a lot of assumptions going into stories that involve humans or human like creatures and this one kind of starts by saying like ah you can't really assume a lot of those things because these are people with very very different um you know lives and motivations and that sort of thing and yeah i, I was struck by that bath scene too because it's like okay there's like there's no time for like romance if you only right. live 10 years. There's no point to it. You don't like, you know, I mean, like biologically, there's no point to it at the very least, right? And yeah. so everyone's just kind of like going through the things they're going through are like from a very different perspective than what you get in basically any other game that involves, you know, humans or human like creatures. Yeah. And the other thing is jumping into this game, it's just like, I don't think I was prepared for just what a production it is <laughs> to go back to the epic production discussion, I suppose. But it's just like, God, this game is huge, obviously, but also just like the cinematography and the fight scenes is amazing. And just like the idea of Nintendo funding an RPG on this scale that is really pushing the switch to its limits. You know, like it's just awesome to see the characters and stuff in this game are yeah. very compelling to me. Um, I'm I don't know. I from a story perspective, like I said, this is probably the most excited i've been about one developing in a while and i think i don't know if you're quite far enough in for this but i feel like the first six hours of the game or so it really it sets you up to like feel like you're you're being smart and you're like i i think i know what's gonna happen next i think i know how this is gonna progress um and you probably do. And then (laughs) just knowing the xenoblade series like it's gonna start getting real weird and 
they lure you into the sense of like you can figure out what's going on and then they pull the rug out on you so i'm i'm very excited to uh, to feel that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's going to be fun for sure. Um, combat is kind of that thing, going back to the original Xenoblade Chronicles, where it's largely about positioning. You're kind of auto-attacking. It's easy to compare it to like, oh, it's kind of like an MMO-style combat, a little bit Final Fantasy XII in there and whatnot, but it's largely just about finding the right position and then doing combos. But then the big thing in this one is that you can fuse with other people, and it's like, they call it the Ouroboros type thing, Then you become this weird, awkwardly walking around <laughs> creature on the map. There are they so don't call many it the human centipede. They don't <laughs> yet. I'll see where the story goes, but as of now, yeah. Well, it also it sounds like they're not humans, pretty explicitly, right? right. <laughs> That's any other thing. Yeah, yeah. The, so there's like there's a lot of combat systems in Xenoblade games, and I mean, you didn't even mention the class changes, which maybe you haven't. I haven't gotten to it yet. Yet, okay. Um, and then there's like all kinds of, you know, there's like skill trees with the Ouroboros and like different like it gets it gets wild and if you just look up like gameplay from mid game you might look at that screen and the ui on that screen and be like dear god i want this thing as far away from me as yeah, possible which is the problem um, i think of the marketing like even you and i did that reaction stream for the last overview and it's like ah, i don't know it's the third entry i can't understand anything on the screen and that just is a recipe for ignoring what is what seems like a great game based on what we've played so yeah far. i i will you know had this with the context of I've played all the Xenoblade games, so I'm very familiar with the combat already, and they're all um, at least to a degree like similar to each other. Like the the whole what you're talking about, the like positioning and the timing yeah. of stuff, like that's very true in in all of the games. Um, so some of it was already kind of familiar to me, but I do feel like they do a fairly good job of layering it on at exactly the right pace, where it's like, okay, now you've kind of mastered this part of it so we're gonna layer on another system for you right um it's still a lot like i'm not gonna lie it is it's i don't know that that's the best way to to make a game is to have that many simultaneous systems going at the same time i find it kind of fun but as i was like fighting a boss this morning i realized as i'm holding my switch my eyes are going like in this kind of U shape <laughs> around the screen, because I'm like monitoring four different things at once. I'm like, is this gauge filled up? Okay, no, that yeah. gauge though, that one's ready to go, and I can then do this. And like, okay, I have a chain attack ready now. Now let me like, like I'm I'm doing this weird like scanning the whole screen back and forth constantly during battles, and I think it's fun, but I also understand why that would just be like horrifying to some people <laughs> well i think it kind of gets that thing of you know are you being strategic in that or are you just watching the meters slowly tick down so you can do another move like that but like you feel like there's enough strategy going into it and you can kind of make a break based on your actions yeah i do i do um i do think that right now in the earlier part of the game the class system doesn't feel like i don't really feel like i understand why i'm changing classes so much okay. like i I get that, you know, it's similar to like a lot of games that implement a class system where it's like, if you get it to a certain rank, then you can like take this move from that class and use it even when you're in another class, you know, like Bravely Default style or whatever, right? Right, right. Um, and so I, I get that, but I don't feel like I understand how to be strategic with that yet. Um, so that part is maybe a little complicated for me still. And I don't know, maybe I'm just... Maybe it's very obvious and I'm just not reading enough tutorials or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I like the combat. I think that you do have to have a mind that kind of um, enjoys that strategic, like MMO-like or even like MOBA-like kind of scanning of You're scaring people away. You're happening. scaring people away, Kelsey. I know, but it's. I'm, I'm just saying if you like that stuff yeah. or if you think you could like it, because I do think it's friendlier than a lot of um yeah then like a moba at, at the very least right like i think it's and it's not turn based right no. or is it kind of, okay yeah. yeah like there's cooldowns on things but right. it's not turn based yeah okay. uh the big thing i'm enjoying my time with this game so far more than i expected i would there is something about this game that i know everybody brings up but it is embarrassing how much they repeat the same lines in combat shouting it again and again and again. And I was bracing for impact, but Kelsey, tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, literally like opening tutorial fights and every fight so far, I hear 
Come here. I got something for you. Every, I'm it, not exaggerating. Every 23 seconds. It is It is ridiculous. excruciating. I don't understand why in the third slash fourth game in this series, depending on if you count Chronicles. Yeah. Um, X, yeah. I, yeah, I don't understand how this is still a problem. Like, everyone knows how annoying this is. It's yes. not cute. It's not quirky. It's just annoying. Um, and I don't know why they haven't figured that out. I think in the remake um, of the first Xenoblade, the one that came out on Switch, yeah. I think you can literally turn it off. Oh my so God, like, really? Someone knows. <laughs> someone there knows how annoying it is. But like, yeah, I... It's. I feel like it's kind of inexcusable in the third game yes. to like still have it be that annoying. I'm like, I don't know what's like. No other game has this problem. No, and the why, fact that it's like from happening? the start, like any playtest you would do, the first note would be like, it's kind of annoying how this person just keeps screaming, "Come here, I got something for you!" Every twenty seconds, and the fights don't last that long, and it's just over and over and over again. I mean, he does have something for them though right like it is he does it is, it's, it's, it's his narratively sword. important right yeah i guess every time he doesn't <laughs> they need to go over to him that's also crucial yeah i guess that is true so combat See, is kind of be at a standstill about. without that but I, I it is impossible so i was like all right i i literally cannot handle this so i'm just going to bring the volume like for the voices which you can control down to a zero and then i got to like this big emotional cut scene and all the characters weren't talking i was like god why can't you just give me the option of turning off combat vo but like i, I think the vo is good other just, than that i literally just like during battles i just volume slider down then when i'm out of the battle volume slider back up this <laughs> is unacceptable it's, yeah it is completely unacceptable also like the music in these games is really good yes! i don't want to like have to not listen to the music yeah it's a new mitsuda soundtrack <laughs> we should be like savoring this and instead i can't hear it because come here i got something for you just over and over and over again oh it's brutal um but hell of a game i'm looking forward to to playing more i'm hoping to, to play more over the weekend and whatnot um but yeah enjoying it a lot more than i thought so check yeah, it out and i'm really i'm really excited to see where like um where it goes. I mean, you you made a really good point about the, like, you definitely don't have to play Xenoblade 1 or 2. Yeah, for sure. Um, 1 and 2, like, the only, the, like, main connection between the two literally happens at the very, very, very end, like, final right. boss battle. Right. So, like, I'm curious to see how that happens in this one. There are some little references to other games, like, there's someone with a the same name as another character Ooh. from another game and there's like a place named the same thing as the place over there but like i don't see any actual connection yet um and i'm curious to see if any of it will ever be obvious or if it will be something i will be like looking up on the wikis later and someone much smarter than me will explain to me like how how it all ties together yeah yeah really curious to see how it evolves um hey kyle do you know how this whole thing operates Hey, I got something for you. Get over here's just a lot of those in a big That's right. basket. It's that, but then it's also partially fueled by Jacob Geller's yawns during our Xenoblade Chronicles 3 discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Which I should have counted I that. was engaged. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Look, I'm if you can't fingers. roller skate up a half pipe and go into slow motion and yeah. shoot missiles out. Needs for to all be I dumber. know, you unlocked that ability halfway through the game. <laughs> That's true. That's and true. You get a lengthy tutorial. Uh, this whole thing exists because of you. It's because of people like you that go to patreon.com slash minmax with two ends it's not just words we say it's actually a url it's a it's a real place on the internet you can go and there's a bunch of different tiers you can choose the level that works for you to help support independent games media if you like the show please help support the show and we want to thank some of our biggest supporters like our dear friends at i am 8-bit they want everybody to know about the stray vinyl soundtrack that you can get at i am 8-bit's wonderful online store and the i am 8-bit exclusive edition of stray on playstation 4 and playstation 5 has a lot of lovable goodies in there including a fuzzy petable patch of the feline hero from Stray. And you can find that in iMateBit's wonderful online store. If you go to that store, you can use the promo code Sturgeon Moon. Sturgeon as in the fish? Moon, no space, 10% off everything in the store under $100. Please check it out. It really is. If you're a geek, and you're listening to this podcast, which I think you're probably a little bit of a geek if you're listening to this podcast, you will enjoy that store. Just go check out I Am 8-Bit and help support them because they support us in a big way. 
by giving away something to the community each and every week. A wonderful prize. If you support us at any tier over on Patreon, you submit a question. We choose our favorite question of the week. That person wins a prize thanks to I Am 8-Bit. And so this week, Kyle, look alive because whoever has the best question will receive the Mega Man X Legacy cartridge that I Am 8-Bit produced, which is pretty cool sweet. Thing. Can you imagine going to your mailbox, Kyle? Getting a new sweet version of Mega Man X sitting in there? Be incredible. And I, can you I hope to live that life? And can you imagine that you only got that because uh, you help support independent games media by supporting Minimax on Patreon? What a twofer! I don't know. Uh, L2 Larson <laughs> writes in and says, Hey, everybody. I just finished playing a game of Fortnite where I played as Goku, picked up a Stormtrooper's E11 blaster, and I killed a Xenomorph. And then Ricky Winterborn follows that up and he says, Hey, is Goku headshotting John Cena with an assault rifle then dabbing on the haters good or bad? <sighs> okay. It's so good. I've decided. It's good. It is I don't good. care. Um, <laughs> I don't <laughs> care. So Dragon Ball is in Fortnite. Uh, very exciting times. Um, I haven't checked it out yet. I hope to check it out by next week because it's, it's up my alley. They got me. It's so silly yeah. and stupid. I, I bought Kratos. And I bought the Warthog, and that's about all I've invested in Fortnite. But I, I think I'm, I think I'm gonna have to buy Goku Vegeta. I want to play as Bulma. Yeah. Uh, so it's that's, that's it's cool Beerus and, and Bulma and Goku and Vegeta. Yeah. yeah. Bulma's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, that's why I want to play as her. Like, Manson. I like that idea <laughs> of just like Bulma with the gun running around in the Fortnite world. Like, I don't know who else do you go for. Like. Blanche? I don't know, like, who's the other, like... He makes, she makes more sense than Goku and Vegeta and Beerus, right. honestly. Like, someone running around with a gun in Fortnite. Well, Beerus the Destroyer, he typically destroys universes by shooting them with an AK-47 slowly, I think is how it typically works. Uh, Jacob, you played this thing? I, I played it. So, I have, I have like, zero history with Dragon Ball Z. What? But, um, I, I did super, play it. So, it's completely and... different. That's right. Um... And, and and so I mean I like I play a lot of Fortnite. It's my it's my gaming with the boys game. Um, and like it's a fun game. It takes a while to kill someone, you know. Like when you have you've got like shotguns and SMGs and whatever, and you whittle people down. Um, and so when I picked up uh, Kamehameha and just like. <laughs> Like, you literally vaporize people. Like, it, it is a <laughs> one-shot kill, and you can get three of them, like, in when you pick them up. And it's... The way that it functions in the game is kind of like... Um, Farah in Overwatch, where you you rise into the air oh, and scream, really? and so you're very visible to everyone, like when you're doing it. But then you can just annihilate people, and if you're playing and you just hear someone scream in the distance, you have no idea if they're going to be like aiming at you or not. And so that's it's amazing. Just, it's like I wouldn't want to play the game like this forever. But for right now, it is just like it's same old Fortnite. And suddenly like gods inhabit the battlefield and can just like smite you at any time. So does Darth Vader fly up and with like a James yep. Earl Jones-esque voice. Yeah, I, I Kamehameha as Indiana Jones yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gaming's good. Uh, yeah, I'm excited <laughs> for this and I think it's all good even though it's, you know, it's dumb, but what are you going to do? Um, but I just am excited about them loosening up that license a little bit. I mean, I feel like everything with Dragon Ball is always so complicated and like Toriyama's art, that's a whole separate license and yada, yada, yada. That's why like Dragon Quest X never came to the States is because Toriyama's licensing deals are so complicated. Um, and so the idea of them signing the paperwork to make this happen just has me hope that like, Maybe someday Dragon Ball will just be on Netflix. You know, maybe we can introduce it to more people because it's so good. They also, they have, again, I'm sorry, I don't know what it is, but in, in Dragon Ball Z, that thing where the two people like touch fingers. <laughs> you can imagine. You it's know just what I'm talking fuse, about? Yeah. It's like, that's an emote, but any two characters can do it. So like Darth Vader can do that with a Xenomorph. <laughs> but then, I mean, they don't fuse. They just touch fingers. That's the end of it. Well, there's kind of there's like a like a power something that looks like it forms between their hands, but no, they don't turn into like one person. Okay, That's it is. Uh, Hanson talking about the reason that you bring up licensing is because we dealt with it firsthand at Game Informer for the yeah, Dragon Ball so. Fighters cover story right, trip, right. and I did one of the things that I'll always be sad we couldn't get through was 
we did the Game Informer logo for the top of the magazine in the Dragon Ball Z logo style. Right. Like they they did the art. They they had it ready. It was Game Informer with the Dragon Ball in the middle, and I loved it. And I was like, this is amazing. I hope we can use this. And they like they backed off. They didn't want to do it for whatever reason. They just weren't li- licensing issues, or they just didn't want to like embrace it and i remember one of the and i thought of that when i saw all the gifts of vegeta doing absurd dances yeah on you know on twitter i'm like so he can do this now but we couldn't get like game and forward logo in the yeah. dragon ball style and i remember even talking to like you know uh the people who made dragon ball z sagas that ps2 xbox game which is not a good game but it was avalanche the team who's now working on the harry potter game and whatnot um, but I remember talking to those developers and they're like, yeah, it was so frustrating because we would like put these moves in the game and then we'd talk to the context at Shueisha or whoever it would be for managing Dragon Ball and they'd say, nope, Goku doesn't do that. That move doesn't exist. And they'd be like, here's the actual clip from the show where this exact thing happens. Like, nope, sorry. <laughs> it's not in this pedigree. It's like, I don't understand what's going on here. Um, no, so it carries it's, guns. it's cool. That's right. <laughs> so I love it. It's weird. Yep. It's pretty weird. Uh, Jake Tricks writes in and asks, what are some gameplay moments in your favorite games that you dread returning to when you replay them? For example, I always hate the sliding puzzle in Resident Evil 4. This was my answer, Ben. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Help me. I, I mean, it's, I haven't played Resident Evil 4 since 2005. What is the sliding puzzle? I don't remember this. It's, it, when you're playing as Ashley, there's one of those things where it's like you can get them like the toys a lot where there are like nine tiles and one of them is missing and you have to move them. Mm. It's so they make like a picture. The Wind Waker thing. Yeah. And it's just like I just I, there's there's a way where you can do it in like nine moves and sometimes i can do that and if i forget it it's just i'm there for like 15 minutes just like moving tiles around oh weird um yeah i was thinking of um one of my favorite games uh yoshi's island every time i start a new game in yoshi's island i'm like oh there is that level towards the end where it's the deep underground maze and i hate it so much and there's a couple of like smaller underground mazes but then you get to that one towards the end and it's just a slog is anybody Did you ever... draw it as a kid? Like my brother drew it like, oh. for us. Like, no, I played that game for the first time in college, so I should have. Oh, right. I should have sketched it out on my iPad at that point. Um, but is anybody ever excited about a maze in a game? Is anybody ever? Ooh, a maze! Why hey, do the mazes? Resident Evil Four hedge maze. Does Great that count? Maze. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's incorrect. I mean, the first time you come across those mazes in Breath of the Wild is pretty incredible. That's true. That's true. But it's like, but being in there isn't really. <laughs> yeah. Like the fourth exciting. time, it's like, I. <laughs> yeah. We all want to be like here. turning, like climbing a cliff and being like, what is that? You know, and it's like this <laughs> giant labyrinth cube in the middle of the, the world. That is weird. Yeah. Because I love nothing better in life than looking at a cool, like, corn maze from like a drone shot or a plane shot, like overhead. It looks awesome. But I don't know how fun it would actually be to be in there. Uh, anybody else got one for a section of a game that they dread? Uh, Blitzball. Oh. In Final Fantasy X. I never, yeah. never want to do that part. Just bypass it entirely? Yeah. I, I had a weird experience with that, too, where I had Waka. Like, he was one of my mains throughout that entire game. But then I had to, like, get his better weapons by playing Blitzball. I'm like, no. I'm just going to have a crappy version of Waka just to spite the existence of Blitzball and I'll stick with like my starter weapon the entire game or whatever the hell. Uh, Drake Heinhorst writes in and says, My 18-month-old son has recently become obsessed with dinosaurs in all forms. Uh, what is it about these creatures that fascinated us much even before we are old enough to comprehend that they actually used to exist? Do you think any more... Okay. There's, this is a two-parter. Do you think any more recently extinct species will become as popular as dinosaurs are now several generations into the future? No. No one's going to care about some species of bat that we killed in 2011 or something. Um, it, it's that they're big, Drake. They're I mean, big and they look care like dragons. about, like, elephants, tigers, you know, yeah. which could go extinct. But the thing about uh, dinosaurs is it's a whole collection you know, yeah. it's like it's like it's like discovering an ancient civilization or something. Right? I think it's the Which, same. Well, it's in the ballpark of like the Pokemon impulse of like there are just cool mm. looking things. And it I am I feel cooler and important if I can memorize all these different things. <laughs> yeah, right? it's like lists. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm like I having do. a favorite. Yes. In a list. Yeah. Yes. You define like I have a thing I can share with you from the list that we both know. Yes. Here's an easily digestible way for me to present my personality is that I'm a stegosaurus kind of guy, you know, like there's something to that, I think. 
One of uh, one of the best episodes of the 99% Invisible podcast is called Jurassic Art. And it's about uh, basically this thing that I did not know, which was like, it's not like for all of humanity, we have thought dinosaurs were cool. And you can actually trace the like cultural interest in them pretty directly to like one guy who started drawing them in a more oh excuse me (laughs) no but it's like it's like before all the art of dinosaurs were just like these lumps that never did anything and then there was like a guy who was like what if i drew a velociraptor running what if i drew like a t-rex roaring and like that is kind of what garnered public interest and his art is still what like jurassic park was using even though you know we have kind of more accurate models and so it's just like it's cool that like they weren't actually always this incredible thing but like now we understand that they were cool and so we're interested in them isn't dinosaurs have incredible marketing yeah (laughs) actually you know um one of my favorite fun facts about game informer is the uh return of the dinosaur issue which is like i don't know issue seven or something like that and uh there, yeah, it was a very, very old, like, I don't know, 1993 Game Informer. Uh, they did an issue that was entirely about how cool dinosaurs are. It had <laughs> almost nothing to do with video games in there. Like, the big cover feature was yeah. just dinosaurs are cool. And it's towards the end of the magazine. It's like a thin magazine back then. And it's basically just a list of, like, here's some places where you can learn more about dinosaurs. <laughs> There's some museums. People really like dinosaurs library. right now. <laughs> and and that's... like, it's not a, it's not like a cover game or anything. It's just like dinosaurs. Real cool. Yeah. It has the aura of like, kind of, you know, during our time at game before every once in a while, a cover story would fall through and it'd be like, Oh crap. Okay. Top hundred RPGs of all time. Like, let's just get some theme out there. But, like, it feels like one of those, but it wasn't. It was just, well, Jurassic Park's coming the out. The idea so of it to... being the seventh issue of just, yeah, like, we're out. We did six <laughs> worth of content, but the seventh. <laughs> and then the joke was on us, because that's how Game Informer won its first Pulitzer, I think, was for the Return of Dinosaurs issue. Oh, is that right? Isn't, isn't it weird, though, that dinosaurs, first of all, existed, and I bet they looked really cool and all that stuff, but then just, like, it was it late 1700s, early mid 1800s when people started digging up the bones. Like, you know, if you're talking about things to do, if you're traveling back in time, I feel like going back to even like the 1600s and being like, under this earth right now, <laughs> there are giant bones and fossils of creatures that existed. Like, I feel like you could really blow some minds. And it wasn't that long isn't ago. That, isn't that a theory of like why every culture had dragons? Is yeah. because like they all dug up dinosaur bones and were like, what are these? Do you think that's true? I don't know. I, I, it's an interesting theory, but it's like, I think people would just like big, scary lizards regardless, you know? Like, like, all of them? <laughs> I don't know. They probably had like, you know, sphinxes and stuff like that. I don't think anybody was seeing two skeletons next to each other and being like, I think this bird lion existed, you know? Well, but all cultures did not have sphinxes. <laughs> <laughs> but they should have. Yeah, that's true. But I guess all dragons are different. I don't know. I mean, would you... Dude, would you put money down that that is the reason uh, dragons exist? I know, because I don't think it's like there wouldn't be dragon-esque dinosaur fossils everywhere, right? Right. Like the different dinosaurs would live in different places, even though there's Pangea. I don't know. No, it would be really cool, though, is if it like tracked like, you know, more like the Chinese dragon uh, Shenron, you know? Um, If like that dragon mapped to like, oh, the dinosaur bones in that area were for snake-like dinosaurs. I don't know what the equivalent mm-hmm. would be, but you know, like, mm-hmm. it'd be cool if, like, if we now could figure out and rewind the clock and figure out the history of why they chose that dragon design, but I don't think it maps out that easily. Uh, Steven Lamson asked Kyle, Kyle, do you know what the D stands for in D-pad? Direction. Directional. I think it's digital, isn't it? I thought it was direction pad. Uh-oh. Kelsey, do you know? Dragon Ball. Di- I always thought it was directional. <laughs> Hang on. Yeah. Now I need to look this up. I thought it was like analog versus digital. Like a digital was like a discrete number of things. D pad. Yeah, but it's like the first D pad implementation pad. is the Game and Watch. Is that right? I don't. I guess I don't really understand my LCD technology uh, yeah. <laughs> quite that well, well to wait. know if that counts as digital so here's or not. Wikipedia. The first sentence: a D pad (parentheses short for directional pad). Or digital pad. Uh, mm. Officially uh, referred to by Nintendo as the plus control pad as a flat. Usually plus thumb control pad. Often digital That's weird. So it stands button. for both? 
Yeah, I guess. But directional's first, so me and Kelsey are right. Hang on, let me just edit Wikipedia real quick. Yeah, I see digital pad <laughs> is first, actually, so that's interesting. Now it stands um, for dunce pad. <laughs> Tony the Swordsman writes in and says, What game's map do you all know well enough that after not playing for a while, if you were dropped in that world, you know it like it was the neighborhood you grew up in? Personally, I think I got Camarocho. Uh, I got a solid one since I can tell where I am by what guys I want to beat up. Okay. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, I mean, Ocarina's Hyrule. Yeah. You know. I'm sure there's a mod, like a VR mod, to just walk around Hyrule. I should do that. That would be a really engrossing yeah. experience. To just walk from Kakariko to, like, you know, Death Mountain. That's actually a pretty short walk. But Yeah, how much is going on <laughs> in that field, though? It's just like there's a ridge here, there's some flowers here, there's a big spinny thing here. But it's not that big, is the thing. It's not like this vast, boring thing. Like, it doesn't take that long to get from one place to another, you know? Right, right. So, so maybe it's not a big deal that it's not that geographically interesting. Yeah. But. Um Dark Souls. I can like the 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 map is so I feel like when I can't remember how to get somewhere in Dark Souls, it feels the same way where it's like I know I've driven here like 20 times. Like it 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 exists as like a real place that just like sometimes I can remember which turn to take and sometimes I can't, but it's like I know that whole world. Yeah. Ryan McGinnis writes in and says, Howdy Ben and the Howdy Bens. Sure. Are y'all getting enough sleep? My wife got me a Fitbit watch so we can try to keep track of our health better. You wear it while you sleep and it tells you how much you get and how good the sleep was for you. That seems odd. Uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan, I, I have a sensor in my mattress and every day I get an email that grades me on my sleep. What? What kind and of I twisted like, world are you living in? And I kind of look at it every day and I'm like, I don't really know what to do with this. Like, I can't study. <laughs> get a better score. It. I guess I just, yeah, exactly. I mean, I guess I go to bed earlier is what it's trying to encourage me to do. Yeah. But well, what time do you go to sleep? Between midnight and one, usually. And then you wake up when? Mm, 8.30. Okay, interesting. I'm I'm top-notch sleeper. I think I'm just getting better and better. Like, You're a pro. Yeah, I'm, I'm a pro. Like, Speed running it? That's right. Going to sleep like 10.30 or so, then waking up between like six and seven and then like immediately go for a long bike ride out of the gate every morning. And I feel like I got it down to a system wow. now and it's really good. Did you pick this question just so you could brag? Is yeah. that <laughs> How do you think <laughs> I pick all these questions, Kelsey? It's just opportunities <laughs> to brag. I, I got good at sleeping for a little while and I've kind of fallen off and lost it. Like I was in a pretty good clip of like asleep by 11 up by seven or seven thirty, feeling okay. Um, yeah. But I'm now more like asleep by midnight up at seven but i don't feel good about it and i'm groggy till like 8 30 so yeah are you doing better this is the big refrain for you since the episode of better quest but are you getting better about getting out of bed right away i am still getting out of bed by like a time that like i'm, be I'm definitely better about it but i was on a really good streak for a while and i'm not on the like I i'm like i would give myself like an 80 80 okay. percent you know okay. I got like a b is this xenoblade's fault uh no it's like i have like four jobs fault probably yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a classic mistake <laughs> so you're checking email like within minutes of waking up uh you, no usually i like at least get myself some coffee and maybe eat before i do that okay out of all your different responsibilities who like where do the most urgent messages come from is the, like, the store really yeah because like there, I mean, I put more work and time, I think, these days into the foundation. But if if I get a message about the store, it's probably urgent-ish. Right, right. Like, it's usually things like, we're out of this, or like, so-and-so is sick. And, you know, we somehow didn't pay for this convention, and now they're yelling at us. I don't know, just like <laughs> any kind of... Any kind of random uh, panic-inducing thing like that. Yeah, make them stop yelling at us. Uh, well, hey, speaking of the store, uh, Enraged Platypie writes in and says, Hey, my main reason for writing is to shout out Kelsey's store, Pink Gorilla Games, in Seattle. Aww. My wife and I spent our honeymoon Emerald in the Seattle City. area. That's right. Oh, I've heard of that. And took the time <laughs> to drive across town to visit the university location, and we were blown away by how cool Pink Gorilla Games was and how awesome the store staff were. We bought shirts and stickers and had a blast. And even though I got carpet bombed with seagull poop earlier in the day, it still ended up being one of the best days of the trip. Thanks in no small part to Pink Gorilla Games. 
Look at that. Oh, that was that's so nice. What a nice thing to write in and say. Thank and you. And then they say, you shouldn't have said that, Kelsey, because no. Uh, then they oh, say, no. uh, I was wondering, though, since my wife and I got so many funny looks when we told people we were going to have our honeymoon in Seattle, uh, do any of you have any dream trips that you want to go on? As Floridians, Seattle is exotic as it gets. Now, you could probably imagine something, but Seattle's nice. Seattle's cool. Um, yeah, dream trips? I don't know. Kelsey, as a Seattleite, where do you want to go? Yeah, I mean, I've I've been like most notable places in the United States at this point, but I've basically not been outside of the country at all. Um, at I've been all? To Canada twice, and I don't feel like Canada really counts. <laughs> How dare you? It's just, it's, I mean, like, I don't know, you guys have been to Canada, right? It's, yeah. It's just, it's just also the U.S., but kind of nicer. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's very similar. Um, so, I mean, the obvious answer is like, I want to go to Japan, but that's not happening anytime soon with the way the restrictions still are there oh really um, is it still too tight yeah yeah you still i think you can technically get a tourist visa now but you still have to quarantine for like 10 days so uh, like build in 10 days of sitting in a hotel room before you can even start your trip which like i don't know i don't know about you guys but like i can't just leave no. for whatever that amount of trip time is plus an additional 10 days that's that's like an entire month at that point. So it is. Um, it is mind-boggling that you haven't been to Japan yet, Kelsey. That I feel. I like know. It's an affront to God uh, that you have not gone there. Jeez. Please put it on the list. The second that quarantine. I'm lifts. trying. Okay. I'm trying. I would like to make it out of the country um, next year at some point, though. Like even if it's not Japan, I would like to go somewhere, like somewhere in Europe or somewhere. And I mean, Japan would be my first choice, but if yeah. not, and like, I should go somewhere out of the country. Yeah, I think I'm, uh, I was really spoiled from Game Informer. I got to travel so much. Um, so, you know, every once in a while, my wife will ask, like, hey, we should go on a trip. Where do you want to go? And I'm like, I think I'm good. <laughs> like, I've been, I've been, I think, everywhere I want to go, except for, like, <laughs> I want to go to Australia a little bit. Um, I think is the right way to phrase that. And then Hawaii, I've never been to. So I think we're going to go to Hawaii soon. And Kyle, I can go to all your old stomping grounds from your yeah, you time go through the Jurassic Park stuff. <laughs> Why do you think I want to go, man? Of course, it's the only yeah. reason. I want to have a colorful drink in my hand and look at some Jurassic Park stuff. That sounds like a great trip. <laughs> I'm uh, going to South Korea in November. What? I have, wow. Uh, purchase tickets. Uh, I have Ooh. I have a friend who's studying there, and I uh, cannot think of another situation in which I could go to a place and have someone who like speaks English and can kind of be a tour guide and like yeah. knows the culture and and does all that. Um, I've also really wanted to, I mean, I've never, you know, kind of even started like planning this, but like, I, I want to go to Vietnam and like specifically those places where it's like, it's the water. And then there's just like mountains that are just like coming straight out of the water. Do, do you know, does anyone know what I'm talking about? It looks like <laughs> Pandora kind of, it'd right. always be like when you'd watch like, you know, a, a kind of like travel show or whatever they would always go there and i'd be like that looks insane like yeah. i want to go there yeah yeah vietnam i hear is uh, wonderful like i've heard from people who've toured a lot of asia and they're like quietly vietnam is the coolest place you can go um didn't used to be that way uh let's see uh ian miller writes and says hey i'm min max gang i recently uh and albeit randomly ran into the one and only kelsey lewin at a mariners game in seattle Oh, I remember this guy. <laughs> it may sound goofy, but I was honestly flabbergasted that I ran into someone I watch weekly on a podcast. That's bizarre. Did, were they like yelling your name from across the stadium or what was I like? No, I walked past him on my way, I think, to get ice cream. Um, and uh, yeah, someone just said my name and I turned around and he was like, I watch you on MinMax. Oh, that's so and sweet. I was like, that's so cool. Um, <laughs> and then later, I think I saw him on the screen on the like... The jumbo they said Kelsey Lewin's best friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he held up a little sign. It was crazy. Weird. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. Uh, also, hats off to anybody that is bold and confident enough. I feel like if I, you know, walk by my sister on a sidewalk, I would still do a double take of like, uh, is that actually her? The idea of like recognizing from somebody from a podcast in a place like that and actually yell it out the name confidently. Did I, I think amazing. I shared on the way. Slack the the time that I got recognized at a at a play in Durham. Oh, I it was like I was wearing I was wearing a mask walking out of a bathroom and a guy said, Jacob Geller, Min Max. Whoa. <laughs> like, <laughs> that quickly. That I would never have that like, I wouldn't have recognized me that fast. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> wild. Um, yeah, I got recognized at a brewery. 
I think like earlier this year, somebody came up and it is, it's very fun. It's a delight. And I feel like everyone's always like, they think that we're, I don't know, Kyle, who's the biggest celebrity in the world? Oh man. I, Keanu Reeves. Yeah. They, they, they think we're Keanu Reeves. Come nope. up with one. <laughs> but I feel like every time I've gotten recognized, it's always people who are like, Hey, Van Hansen, like the podcast. All right. And then they like try and like sheepishly walk away. And then I'm the one that's like, wait, no, let's talk about it. What do you like about it? Tell me more, please. What can we do <laughs> better? <your> <laughs> yeah. We are not, we are nowhere even close to anything resembling a level of celebrity where we would be annoyed. By right. Oh yeah. I can't even no. a grocery store. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Garrett Wayne stock writes in and says in 2001, my brother took me to a Nintendo GameCube preview event in Pontiac, Michigan. It might have been at Clutch Cargos, which was an awesome old music venue built out of a church. I remember him taking me through a back door, so I don't know if we were exactly invited or not. There were a ton of demo stations set up all over the place. I played a round of Smash Melee, the Monkey Target minigame from Super Monkey Ball, and some Rogue Leader. I think Star Fox Adventures and Pikmin were at least in video form there. Uh, they were giving away cubes made of foam slices that slotted into each other, and I don't think I have mine anymore. My question is, what was that event? I remember being the only kid. I'm guessing it was like a public promotional tour, but why do we have to sneak in the back with the smokers? I don't know about that, Garrett. I don't know why you had there, to sneak in. There is like an incredible collection that gets pop, like just appears randomly of celebrities playing GameCube games. Because the big <laughs> oh, one. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, like the big one is Bob Odenkirk, at least for me, because I yeah. love Mr. Show so much. But there's this just shot that gets shared periodically of David Cross and Bob Odenkirk playing Smash Brothers. And like the, it turns out there were just like all kinds of weird celebrities at this like GameCube event. So maybe they were doing a bunch of them. Oh, that's like the one sure. with Paris Hilton holding the GameCube and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. There's like the, like someone I think Patrick Klepek might have done a story on it recently. Like sort oh, of weird. like you know these pictures you see sporadically. This was actually all one thing, and it's like what really weird. <laughs> like, um, yeah, I don't know what that event was in particular, Garrett. But um, something that I found recently, which I did not know or remember, was something called the Nintendo Fusion Tour, which was a Nintendo-sponsored, like, rock tour. A lot of pop tour. punk bands, right? Yep, like My Chemical Romance, okay, uh, yeah. Story of the Year, Evanescence, Fall Out Boy, Panic at the Disco. There I were bands this. that would go around, and then they'd have, like, a demo of 1080 Avalanche in the back with this but it's just like a weird moment in nintendo's history that you have like my chemical romance and nintendo touring the country together uh matt wrote in and says hey ben and the pals i love trivia tower this week it aired on monday thank you um i thought Snowbike mike from kind of funny brought great vibes and a lot of laughs the two of which really intersected in that last round where he revealed that his phone lock screen is a picture of himself I don't think we spent any time on that during the show, but the sheer confidence of it killed me. You know, there's a lot of chaos and thoughts and things to manage when Trivia Tower is happening, but it was something that I noticed, and I it's surprising I didn't call that out, because in retrospect, it is bananas for his phone lock screen just to be a giant picture of his face screaming, or whatever the hell it was. Um, and then they ask, anyway, what are your phone lock screens? Do you go to the factory default, family, pets, videos, or do you go for snow bike mic from Kind of Funny? Yeah, I'm going to have to switch mine to Snowbike Mike, I think. Before we get to this question, here's... You all tell me what to do. You tell me what to do when somebody breaks an oath of, of trust. Because, uh, not to spoil this month's episode of Trivia Tower, but here's a little bit of a spoiler, I guess. The, the whole pitch was it was kind of funny versus min-max. It was like the entire kind of funny community versus the entire min-max community. They sent it out to their Patreon supporters and stuff. Um, and then it's like, last community standing wins. And we put some stakes on this bet. And so the stakes were that if min-max wins... Then Snowbike Mike, who has a very signature voice, very kind of gravelly and deep, excellent radio broadcaster voice, the idea was that he would have to start every podcast he was on for the rest of the week by inhaling a ton of helium and then open the podcast that way. <laughs> and I said, all the podcasts happening this week and one stream, one gameplay stream. And he's like, hell, I'll do it for all of them. Hey, Snow Mike Mike here. I'll do it for every gameplay stream. Let's have some fun. And then next cast, we got some Adam Boys going to be on there. We're going to be talking about Rumble Versus. It's going to be great. I'll do it. Let's have some fun. And that's my Snow Mike Mike impersonation. Um, it tuned in to this week's episode of X-Cast. No helium. <gasps> and Min Max kicked their butts in Trivia Tower. What do you do? What, I, mm. I, I gave a light call out on Twitter 
and uh, Garrett over there, I think, I'm sorry, I think Garrett's the name, um, but they say their work are kind of funny. They're like, yeah, he had the helium balloon, but he accidentally popped it before the show started. <laughs> Which I think okay. you at least have to open with, oops, I popped the helium balloon. <laughs> right. I am obligated to be. <laughs> yeah, first of all, I don't oops. buy that. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't buy that. That's a very convenient. If it's, if it's a legitimate yeah. mistake, you can relocate it, you know, to but another podcast. How but. many times have you accidentally popped a balloon in your life? <laughs> it seems like an odd thing to accidentally well, go whoops. Uh, I mean, you know. When you have a child, balloons become a bigger part of your life. Okay. And they do get popped accidentally, and cats get scared. It happens. Okay, so maybe if Snowbike Bike is surrounded by his own children and cats that have not been declawed, that's the only excuse for this type of shenanigan <laughs> happening. But it's like, pff, I don't know what to do. Do I go to the I DOJ? Mean, I, don't, I don't know what, what to do. Some very, so like, I, we don't... I'm almost hesitant to say, like, because I don't... Well, you don't want to overdo it, but, like, it would be maybe the... Our community could gently remind him on Twitter. <laughs> Don't do it, Kyle. You're getting back into your gentle harassment territory. <laughs> yeah. Look, I just I, I, I and look while you're tweeting at yeah. him, just tag Aha drinks and ask him to bring back black cherry <laughs> coffee. Just let's rope it all together. Uh, I, I'm just I'm saying uh, I'm not I'm not angry, but it was a hmm. Okay. No, noted. Kind of funny. Dan Riker wore that dirty shirt for a week. I know it's incredible. Uh, so it's so funny to see him like in a clip on TikTok from Giant Bomb or something. <laughs> He's wearing that stupid shirt. Did you see somebody made fan art of like him as Master no. Roshi wearing that uh, Min Max shirt? Yeah. It's oh, that's good. incredible. I got. Oh yeah, you send that to me. Uh, anyways, yeah. Uh, phone screen. Uh, mine is a very dorky thing that I think I've talked about before, but it's like a sketch from Richard Feynman, and like back when I read. Surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman, in like 2009. I was really into the, the physicist and stuff. And he had a sketch in that book that I that I grabbed where it's like his mathematical equations, but then he also has like sketches of like faces and there's like a naked person. And it's very artistic combined with science. And I thought that was cool. So that's my phone background and I'm never changing no. it. Uh, as a father, I'm legally obligated yeah. to feature my child. Yeah. So it's a lovely picture of my child. Okay. Ooh. Have probably the <laughs> Boo, nerdiest. <children. laughs> I have probably the absolute nerdiest phone lock screen possible. Um, which is that when when there was a a big Nintendo data leak that I totally didn't look at right, and that right. nobody looked at. Mm -hmm. um, there were <laughs> there were files in there thought. that yeah there were files in there that I mean I I didn't see I don't know how it ended up on my phone but uh, that were like the pixel art that ended up being stretched over the 3d models in animal crossing oh, and as, awesome. as pixel art it's very good and you never get to see it as pixel art except for in these files so um i've got oh there's no way this is going to show up well but like the train tracks oh, no, that's good. from the original oh, animal weird. crossing and it's like a very lovely little piece of pixel art that, that is like. sweet that is such a good deep cut Ugh. It is it is the absolute deepest cut <laughs> in the world, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, mine is very boring. I just have the like an Apple one because I like how it changes between day and night. Oh, it um, does. But my uh, my my desktop wallpaper is cool. Um, it's it's the it's from Zachtronics Eliza. Can I share my screen? I don't know if this will work. I have no idea. I, I think it would break everything. But you're welcome to share. Uh, I won't. I won't do it. I okay. don't want to break everything. But it's uh, look. I got I got good desktops, but my phone <laughs> is just nothing. Okay, that's fine. Uh, ben Shively writes in. Um, whew, tough one, Ben. And they say, if you magically had the ability to find out, would you want to know if you've already experienced the best day of your life? No. no. Wouldn't you be kind of a little be curious? The value of that? What would be the value of that? That's a good point. Well, I think the value would be like, well, now I need to up it. Unless this is like a fate situation, you can't change it. Well, I yeah, guess oh, it does would it be mean? Fate. Yeah, well, then you couldn't up it. Like, what do you mean? That's that's the whole question. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I'm not into your mumbo jumbo about time travel. I guess that's true. Yeah, I guess there's not really an upside to that, is it? But it's a sad thing. Do you think, Kyle, if you had to bet, do you think the best of your life's in the past? Uh, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I don't know. I'm okay what, with that. I'm not, not trying a to be, bad thing, really. No, I'm not trying to be cynical, but I'm like, oh, I think it totally is. Yeah. I, like, I don't know. I think if you ask people on their deathbed, like, when was the best day of your life? I don't know how many people are saying about something north of 35 or something unless they I get mean, married. I mean, you're, yeah, that. you're married. You have yeah. a 
children like you know those are those are pretty much the days yeah kyle <laughs> honest, honestly <laughs> if you had to choose and your kids aren't listening and your wife isn't listening but like yeah day of marriage or the day of your daughter being born which was like the better day of your life Oh, uh, marriage, marriage for sure. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it, because like the thing about the, a childbirth is not to get too deep into this. It's 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 like the most anxious I've ever been in my entire life. It's yeah. like so nerve wracking and scary and exciting, like and wholly memorable. Like one of the most insane things that's ever happened in my life. But like the whole day, I just remember sitting. My wife went and got taken to another room, and I wasn't ready to join her yet. And I remember just sitting there, like so looking so anxious sitting on a bed that a nurse like stopped as she was walking by and like doubled back and she was like can I get you something like maybe like an apple juice or something just to sort of like distract you a little bit and I was like yes please so I just sat there drinking apple juice like not sure not had no idea what the next hour was going to hold for my life it was oh, it was God. it was amazing but terrifying sounds magical uh <laughs> yeah uh, sounds magical puss puzzle right then I can't say that word uh, hey, everybody. Uh, many games, especially AAA games, for many years attempted to create the quote-unquote powerful speech scene. The main character rallies NPCs to inspire them for a final showdown or to celebrate a great victory. What is striking with all these scenes is that most engines can't populate the scene with too many characters. What is meant to be a crowd of hundreds is most, of, most often five to ten characters with maybe two different animations spread around. Can you recall any good speech scenes in a video game? Excellent question. Cool. I mean, the, the crowd is an interesting part because my head went right. to like Metal Gear and like right. defeating a boss and getting the monologue. And the monologue is always conceptually stupid, but totally engaging and interesting. Yeah. And this great, even in the Game Boy Color game, the, the boss monologues are just like totally interesting and like worthy rewards for defeating them in battle. The, the speech in MGS4 when Liquid is like, pointing his fingers at oh, all the boats and blowing so them up good it's so good um yeah i think i think what they're going for here is the more like that independence day speech thing which i, I get that games go for like i always remember when we did the deepest dive on mass effect there's like that moment toward the end where it's like oh we're talking about shepherd becoming the human specter and really laying into the council and all that stuff and I remember Leo Vader was describing the crowd that was like, because, you know, the whole thing is like, oh, people are coming to the edge of the Citadel to look at Shepard give this speech. Um, and <laughs> Leo Vader described the crowd as an Xbox 360 amount of people. <laughs> Which really is oh, back like, so it's like eh, six and a half or so out there. Um, I thought of, again, not knowing crowd, but I just immediately thought of the Wolfenstein games because I think they have some of the best uh, acting. Mm. But there is that scene when um, I guess I won't say exactly what happens, but there's there's essentially like a Nazi rally um, and it's held on the steps of uh, the Lincoln Memorial, Ooh. I think. But it's like you look out and... You know, they're not high detail, but it does look like there are like a hundred thousand people standing okay. there and it's like it's it's pretty terrifying. Yeah. Um so yeah, that's a cool one. Yeah. This is the sequel you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. We're and, like the and, craziest and, thing in the whole series. <laughs> yes. Okay, I was, I was just making sure. Yeah, interesting. Uh Captain Cobblepot writes in and says, Hey Min Maxers, look, I feel gross including this, but Kyle, uh, you're kind of obsessed with tweets and promotion and all this stuff the same way and i've run into the situation everyone's of like oh we have a lot of like good content in our backlog at this point it's weird that min max has been around for so long that it's like we should probably surface our old content a little bit more you know we could just spend a week promoting old deepest dives you know the point is captain cobblepot wrote in and they say hey i've been going through some of the old deepest dives the super mario 64 uh deepest dive specifically and that show doesn't get enough credit on the internet great show and well worth the five dollar tier for podcast versions of it was that gross to read? Or is it just nice to remind people that we did this deepest dive in Super Mario 64 and it was a lot of fun? I think it's nice. Yeah, That's those nice. deepest dives, okay. like, they're not podcasts. They don't get old. Yeah. You can, you can just listen to them. That's right. Thank you. Um, but Kelsey thinks that was a little gross to include. It was kind of... <laughs> uh, I mean, you included the nice long thing about ah. how great Pink Gorilla is. See? So, uh, it look, that was excellent. Um, because the one about Pink Gorilla was excellent. Thank so you. Okay, it's... there we go. Locked in. <laughs> uh, Owen McCarter writes in and says, Hey, Min Max, we've had some solid action movies out this year, like Prey, Top Gun Maverick, and had me thinking about the classics like Die Hard, Terminator 2. Do you think there's been any action movie from the past couple of years that will obtain classic status and remain beloved for the next couple of decades? Yeah, yeah for sure. We say it at the same time. 
Uh, oh, three, two, one. Mad, Mad Max Fury Road. Fury Road. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can we all say Mad Max Fury Road? Yeah, yeah okay. I think I think that is the answer. Um, although I think with the success, I think Top Gun Maverick is going to be an action top tier pantheon for the rest of time. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's it's hard because like when they get up there, like Mission Impossible Six might be my favorite in the uh, franchise, mm-hmm. but like the sixth movie in a franchise is never going to become like an action classic. It's just right. too kind of into the series. Uh, but Mad Max totally will. And, and Top Gun probably will. You know what I was thinking about uh, just this morning? I was thinking about um, how Tom Cruise with Jerry Maguire seems like in particular, like he probably had a lifetime of people screaming, Hey, Tom Cruise, show me the money. Do the catchphrase. Uh, what's his other lines from that movie? You complete me, all that stuff. Um, and it's weird that he's had some of the biggest movies over the last decade or so with, you know, Mission Impossible, now Top Gun Maverick becoming the biggest movie, uh, ever existing on planet earth, but like no catchphrases. There's no like signature lines from the later generation Tom Cruise action films, right? Isn't that weird? Yeah. Like maybe, I don't know, talk to me goose, but it's <laughs> right. like, that's not like, you know, yeah. that's not fun to say. Yeah. Like what you'd go up. And just walk by on the street down and be like, that's the only one I've got. Like, you know, there's like good lines in Maverick, but it's not like anything that is really going to be the go-to catchphrase. So he must appreciate that, that now he just, he probably just has people being like, hey, Mission Impossible rules, instead of just people jumping in front of his car going, show me the money, you know? He does, he does a pass on the script and he's like, this is too, maybe too iconic. <laughs> yes. Make right. this bad. Uh, let's turn this into a cliche. Yeah. Okay. How convoluted can we get this Mission Impossible plot so they don't have time to even remember anything about what anybody's saying? Um, Harrison Holt McHale writes in and says, Hey everybody, I've been uh, watching The Big Bang Theory and I've really enjoyed it so far. It's been a long time since I've watched a sitcom properly and I have a new appreciation of those bite-sized episodes. Do you think there is room for this model in the gaming industry? Like a new 20 to 30 minute experience every single week? It could share themes or characters from previous weeks or be completely unrelated and brand new. Is this completely unrealistic from a production standpoint? Kind of, I yeah. feel like Playdate is the closest. Yeah, the concept of the Playdate is yes. the closest thing we have to that. I mean, it's not sitcommy in any way, but the like small experiences on a regular cadence, which I still adore the idea of, and I think that like it's very difficult for it to be practical in a lot of people's lives. I still like uh, yep. I still want that in the world, and I love it, but I also did not keep up with my weekly playdate updates. Yeah, did you have, you didn't have like, because we had the press version where it was kind of all unlocked ahead of time, but for you, you had the version where it was like slowly trickling out and the whole thing? Yeah, and I, I was, I did it for a, a few weeks and yeah. then I would like fall off for a while and then I'd come back, but like I really wanted it to be like a every week I check in and, and try my new little experience. And I think that's just like, logistically kind of hard for a lot of people's lives or mine maybe maybe it's just a me problem no, but I, I still mean, really love the idea well that's I think the problem is like you love the idea but you were the exact demographic for somebody to really get into that structure and so like if it didn't work for you like I don't think it's possible for anybody right yeah I mean I thought like maybe the elusive targets in Hitman are oh, kind yeah. of like this yeah you know because it's like you releasing content weekly is just impossible but like you can kind of just you know at added be like kill this guy now and like leo likes that but i just think yeah. we don't it's hard to play a game for that long you know like weeks over weeks i don't know yeah uh, Chris Logan writes in and says, Hey, Ben and the Horts, uh, retro gaming can be an expensive hobby these days as the value of old games skyrocket on the open market. Let's take a look at some examples in a little game I like to call Nintendo. As in dough, like money. Um, okay, for each pair of games released on a Nintendo console, can you guess which one has a higher value today? All right. I don't want to put Kelsey too much on the spot, but I feel like this is... Oh, I'm going to nail this. <laughs> I'm going to, like... This will not be it's difficult Kelsey's for box me. office Okay, game. I mean, Kelsey, yeah. do, I, do I have permission to only ask you these questions to see how well you can do on this? Uh, yeah, although that, like... That's that's is that fun to like? I don't want to answer them. Yeah, it? please. Just everyone else is me. guessing. Like you're the one that can run as fast as you can here. Okay. Okay. Let's okay. Uh, this. So, Let's which is worth more on the used game market? Mega Man Soccer on Super Nintendo or Disney Sports Basketball on GameCube? Ooh, 
I feel like those are actually kind of close in value. Um, I think Mega Man Soccer has shot up more recently, but the GameCube market has been really hot. I'm going to go with the Disney one. Yeah, no. good call. Okay. 165 versus Mega Man Soccer is $80. All right, here it's we like go. like price charting probably what they're looking at? I'm not sure. Uh, is that a good that's site? That's my Kelsey? guess. Uh, okay. okay, so price charting is pretty <laughs> good at getting you, like, what you should do is never take that number that it spits out at face value. You should, like, it gives you a list of all of the, yeah. like, recent sales. Look at those and not at the, like, number it spits out. Because it'll be like, yeah, this is a $50 game. Also, the last 10 times this sold, it was for $85. But, you know, one time it sold for 20 So, mm, it's not, right. like, the, the algorithm, I don't think, is, like, super good on it. Or the um, equation, I should say, I don't think is super perfect. But it is, like, a really good aggregate of the data. So, it's a good thing to look at. Gotcha. Uh, Earthbound on Super Nintendo or Chibi Robo on GameCube? Complete. Complete. Are we, are we going like, like is Earthbound loose and See, Chibi you're Robo? At, you're is, asking too many questions. Um, I know they, these ones are also really close. Last time I checked, Chibi Robo was like two sixty and Earthbound was like two eighty. So I'm gonna go with Earthbound, I guess, but they're probably really close. Earthbound, correct. The numbers they have and who knows are 339 versus Chibi Robo 170. Very impressive so far, Kelsey. Okay, here we go. Home Improvement on Super Nintendo or Three Ninjas Kick Back on Super Nintendo? Three Ninjas Kick Back. Correct! At 123 versus Home Improvement 84. How can you be confident in that? I... I run a store. <laughs> like, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> we sell 40 copies of Three Ninjas Kickback every week. <laughs> oh my Actually, God. I don't think I've seen a copy of Three Ninjas Kickback in probably four years. But like, we sold so many copies. I still copies. know it is an expensive game. Yeah, that is ridiculous. Okay, let's see. Uh, we have Paper Mario Thousand Year Door on GameCube or Battletoads on NES. Oh, definitely Thousand Year Door. Correct. Uh, about double versus, uh, it's like 76 versus 30. Wayne's World on NES or Fester's Quest on NES? Wayne's World by a ton. Correct. Wayne's World 250, Fester's Quest 8. <laughs> that is stunning. Kelsey Lewin, ladies and gentlemen. Perfect yeah, she, game. She went in with confidence and like killed it. Jesus why, Christ. Why are GameCube games so expensive? So the GameCube sold like really terribly. Um, like it is other than the Virtual Boy, like Nintendo's worst console, basically, uh, in terms of just straight up sales figures. Uh, Even so there's... with Wii U? Oh, well, okay, yeah, Wii U's worst. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um... I just want to make sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking like retro. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a very beloved console that like not actually that many copies exist out there of these games. And GameCube discs are more... Um, I don't want to say fragile as in like they break literally snap easier, but like scratches on them do more damage than the scratches on like a PS2 disc. Oh, that's instance. interesting. So like they are easier to die. It's easier for them to like just be done. Yeah. Ha. Huh. I never thought of it that way. That's really interesting. Uh, what do y'all like for a question of the week? Man, I, um, I, 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 I kind of like that. I, yeah, I, I was actually thinking dinosaurs, but Kelsey too. like blew me away so much with that last question. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, my Whoa. answer was going to be dinosaurs, but that last one was really fun for me. I, uh, I got uh, to feel really smart. Yeah. So yeah. Sure. Okay, I was leaning dinosaurs <laughs> as well, but Kelsey, it's your call since you're uh, coming off the big victory. Oh, no, let's do dinosaurs. All right. If we're all feeling dinosaurs. We're always feeling That's dinosaurs. Great. There we go. Congratulations to Drake Heinhorst. Which sounds like a dinosaur name. Uh, you just won a wonderful prize from I Am 8-Bit. Mega Man X Legacy Collection Cartridge Thingy. Um, now it's time for something called Get a Load of This. Mine, I'm technically repeating myself because in Party Chat I talked about it um, on this week's episode of Party Chat, which is our Patreon-exclusive podcast. Um, I unpacked my full thoughts on E.T., which I saw for the first time uh, this last week, um, which is weird because I'm a big Spielberg fan. Um, but I had a lot of thoughts on it and really, really loved it, believe it or not. Good film. But, um, hey, get a load of this. Did you know that there's a deleted scene from E.T. with Harrison Ford as Elliot's principal? You can find it on YouTube, and it's really weird. Did you know this, Kyle? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it's a weird scene where, like, Harrison Ford, they're, like, not showing his face, but it's him, like, yelling at Elliot, being like, mm, stay off the pot, you crazy loon. And then E.T. makes Elliot's chair float around the room and... Harrison Ford, the principal, gets all scared. And it's weird. Yeah, because so, it was just too distracting to have suddenly 
a big big name like Harrison Ford show up in the middle of the movie, right? Yeah, he's more notable than an alien existing on Earth. Yeah, and they do they they do show his face in the cut. I don't think they do. I don't, it's okay. a lot of very cheeky camera movement to the point that it'd be like distracting if you saw it. I think yeah. it's like what is going on here? Is he another alien? Um, anyway, that's mine. Uh, Kyle, you got one. Hey, uh, get a load of this. This is a, a official marketing material for Mario Sports Mix on the Wii, a game we, of course, all remember and played That's significantly. Right. That's right. Uh, it was shared by at uh, Destructo underscore Dan on Twitter. And um, it, what the thing that's weird about it is it just has Mario like talking in like like long sentences. Right. Like, the video is right. like two and a half minutes long of Mario at like a press conference, and I don't like it. It's unnerving. It is like the most Martinet has ever talked as Mario. Yeah. Isn't that weird promotional video? Yeah, it is unnerving. Um, there's links below for all this funky stuff. Uh, Jacob Gallery, you got one? Uh, get a load of this. Um, we all like to eat figs, right? That's right. Love them. You like a fig? Um, here's something that I learned uh, just today. A fig is one. Uh, it's not a fruit. It's an inverted flower. It's a flower that blooms inward. What? Uh, two... The way that that flower is pollinated is a wasp goes in there. It's called a fig wasp. It crawls into the fig and it dies. And then it just liquefies. And so when you eat a fig, you're eating liquefied wasp. Yeah, I love it. Why did you tell me this? And they're good as hell. (laughs) I really like figs. Why did you do I this? Had, to me? I had the moment. Have you seen? Have you seen Snowpiercer? You know, there's that scene yeah. where they find out that they've been eating this like vitamin bar and it's just like churned up bugs. Yeah, like, it's like that's what a fig is. I love it. Uh, that that'd be a good way to die, or not to die, but I guess to like you know a good thing to do with your body. Like if I could be liquefied and turned into a inverted flower that seems like a cool way to go other than oh what, i thought you were because it's like well that happens in the matrix they liquefy the bodies and yeah they feed that them seems to great doesn't it i want to be that little baby <laughs> they uh, have like tree coffins now you can be buried as like part of a tree i'm confused kind of i assume and that then you can eat the tree wait a minute good idea do figs grow on trees look this isn't dan reichardt and some <laughs> giant bomb podcast we can't we can't go down this rabbit hole uh kelsey do you got one uh, yeah, get a load of this. Uh, there is a cool site that was launched, I don't know, maybe a month ago or so called uh, The Thrilling Tales of Old Video Games. And it's just, it's one guy and he's just making a bunch of like short articles answering some uh, like small questions that are that are kind of fun. Like, um, oh, uh, who put Pit in Kid Icarus? Like, why is the name Pit? And uh, there's hmm. one about like, why is Blanca green? Um and they're just they're just fun little you know small dives into little weird parts of history. Yeah, so I like it. I love uh, it. Called the the thrilling tales of old video games dot com, or it's cool. just no the thrilling tales of old video games dot com. Okay, there's a link below for everybody. Check it out. Um, let's see from the Discord channel, the community channel for the get a load of this, where they're sharing these all the time. Um, that flow state shared an article from Kotaku where the headline says. Uh, she convinced men on Tinder to buy near Automata and then ghosted them. I guess just there's a lady on Tinder and just reached <laughs> out to right. dozens of men, convinced them to buy the game and then never uh, went on a date with them. And Yoko Taro uh, retweeted that article and he just said, glory to mankind. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's Yoko Taro, right? He's catfishing them. Right? Yeah, I think so. Probably. Ooh. Yeah. I would do that. That's a really good marketing strategy. <laughs> it is super smart for sure. Uh, all right, that's it for this episode of the Mac Show. Thanks so much, everybody, for watching or listening, helping to spread the word about everything we're doing here. We appreciate it. Uh, we have a lot going on. This is one of those weeks where I feel like we are going at maximum efficiency. Uh, we're cranking a lot of stuff out, so I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, coming up later this week on Friday, we have the Mac Spoilers with Kyle and I talking about Dragon Ball Super colon superhero genuinely one of my favorite films of the year that movie is such a blast so uh that'll be in the bonus podcast feed and also available on youtube um and then also something that is exclusive to the bonus podcast feed so that's if you're a five dollar supporter you unlock you know if you want more than double the amount of podcasts you can listen to from min max each and every week you can unlock that bonus podcast feed right in your favorite podcast app but there's a hot exclusive this week kyle which is it's a discussion with me, Jacob Geller, and Leo Vader, and special guest Benjamin Reeves about our love for the television show community. So go ahead and uh, fat dog your way over to Patreon and uh, <laughs> throw down some money to hear that conversation. Yeah. 
Did I use that I mean, correctly, Jacob? I don't think I did. <laughs> I don't think anyone can use it correctly. Yeah. I, legitimately, You'd be I think. Ahead if you. <laughs> I mean, it's it's the hardest I've ever laughed like doing a podcast. You know, we are we are essentially in tears, just like recounting bits that happen on community to each other yeah it's basically if you ever want the deepest dive on the tv show community it's kind of this bonus podcast so check it out here's a here's a clip for you don't be confused this is a clip from that patreon exclusive here you go i'm trying to remember which episode it's in but uh bear down for midterms yes and then <laughs> yeah. and then <laughs> chang like crying because they don't want to use his slogan and they go with it and then they find out he's like about that bear attack and he's like that's oh, why right. i thought of that. <laughs> that's one of the funniest <laughs> jokes in any sitcom ever and then i i think about it like pretty pretty frequently where they change to fat dog for midterms and they're like don't oh, sweat right. it fat dog <laughs> oh my god there's a brand new dance based on an old phrase <laughs> Oh. oh, that I is making like me cry just with. remembering it. <laughs> that uh, the fat dog line at the end, like the the bear down on it thing, is funny in and of itself. But then, like they tag on the fat dog, <laughs> and like they change the bear costumes to dogs by just adding ears to them. Is oh, that's so good. Also on our YouTube channel uh, this clip. week, we have uh, <laughs> what a great clip. <laughs> But uh, we have the new episode of Wii Sports, which is, of course, Wii Sports Baseball, where it's Brian Vore and Leo Vader and I um, sweating our buns off and playing baseball or trying to in a field. And it was a lot of fun. So thanks, everybody, for voting for that. And then also we had the first episode of New Show Overflow, where we got to revive one old rejected idea for a new show plus, And uh, we chose Happiest Birthday. So what this show was, it was Janet and I, and we found three members of the community who had a birthday on that day or just a couple days off. And then we called them up on that show, got a sense of what they liked for gifts and what they were like as people. And then we bought them gifts on air. So those birthday presents are currently being shipped off to these people. So you can check out that show on YouTube. It's a very fun time. It's a fun way to celebrate the community. Um, then also we have an interview that just went live on YouTube and then in the bonus podcast feed as well. And it's with Christopher Sundberg, who's the co-founder of Avalanche Studios and the creator of Just Cause. But it's a, it's a very fun interview where he left. He started a new studio called Liquid Swords. And it's just one of those, it is like the perfect Venn diagram that Kyle, I feel like we're just talking about for interviews where it's like somebody who has a long, interesting career in the game industry is now independent, going off doing their own thing out of the PR cycle. And so it's just a good opportunity to walk through his entire career with him talking about Just Cause, talking about Mad Max in retrospect, you know, that project's confusing origin where Corey Barlog from the God of War series was also working on Mad Max in the beginning and working with George Miller and what that's like to have George Miller on one end and WB on the other end pulling the game apart. Um, but then also the fun thing is we walk through all of the canceled projects from his entire history in the game industry. Like he was working on a Tremors game for PS2 uh, before that was canceled. And then at Avalanche, he was working on like a 1930s steampunk game with THQ that was canceled. And then also like a fantasy version of Just Cause that was canceled. And then the, the juiciest one is he talks about there was an Iron Man open world game that Avalanche, the Just Cause creators, were creating back in 2012 before Marvel and Disney canceled that as well. So uh, check out that interview if you want to learn just about, you know, a full journey of this developer, Christopher Sundberg, and all the highs and lows along the way. And it's a, it's a revealing look at the game industry. So I hope you all enjoy it. Um, Kelsey, you got anything you want to plug? Uh, sure. Uh, continue to check out the uh, Video Game History Hour podcast uh, that the Video Game History Foundation does. And uh, I don't know if you happen to be in the Emerald City this weekend. Uh, <laughs> I will be at Emerald City Comic Con and, uh, you know, and PAX as well. If anyone, I don't know if anyone's going to PAX West, but we'll be at PAX in, in two weeks as well. Awesome. Sweet. Jacob Geller, what do you got going on? Um... Uh, last week, I put out a video called Gross Games About Flesh and Stuff. Uh, it features one of MinMax's favorite games of the year, How Fish is Made. Yeah. Um, you can watch that on YouTube. Uh, real, like, heed the content mornings at the beginning because it is a gross ga uh, video about flesh and stuff. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's good. Awesome. People, people like it. Cool. Thanks so much for watching and listening, everybody. Well, I got a plug, too, man. Oh, Christ. Kyle wants to get on this. Yeah, what do you got? I told my boss to more that I would get a GameSpot plug, and that's the requirement for being on the podcast. Damn it! During work hours, and so I just told him I'd plug his Twitter account, and he said that was okay. So go follow <laughs> Tamora H on Twitter. 
I feel like his, he's got a lot of dumb jokes. You know, tomorrow he's a very smart guy, but there's a lot of really dumb jokes on his Twitter account. And everyone sounds like, I appreciate that. That's delightfully stupid. And then, like, one out of every 15, it's something that I think is just stunningly stupid. <laughs> like, just <laughs> next level stupid pun. But hey, check it out, everybody. Um, and thank you to all of Min Max's $50 supporters, the game champion tier. The following people have chosen out of any game under the sun that they want to be declared the champion of these games. So, Jawar Hello is officially the champion of Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. Of course, prettygoodprinting.com, our dear friends over there. Uh, they chose Celeste, but the Pico 8 version of Celeste. Very specific choice, but I love it. Uh, of course, games.archer.com. Speaking of how Fish was made, this is somebody who got connected to us because we played their games on Steam Secret Stash. But out of any game under the sun, they chose the Search for Fran 2. So they are the game champion of that. Kendrick Fortune is officially the champion of Assault Android Cactus. Which is that, um, it's a good game, and I didn't realize that it's the same people who made uh, Unpacking. But, like, their first game was, like, this action-packed game, and that game rules. Uh, Miguel Magi wrote in, uh, didn't write in, but uh, the game they're championing is Mega Man Battle Network 3, colon, white. Very specifically, that game they're the champion of. Patrick Polk chose Bayonetta. Atsego 12 chose Remnant from the Ashes. Thanks, everybody, for supporting us in a huge way and choosing a game to become the champion of. All right, that's it. Thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate it. Be good. Have fun. Let's go. Let's go.